Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing? Hey, someone just asked about Christian Prince. Christian Prince is uh, scheduled to be on with us tomorrow. Oh, geez, why? But uh, they asked a specific question. Um, Akeem said, uh, David, Christian Prince wants to know what program you use to capture the chat comments and post it on the screen. Please answer. Thank you. Um, Akeem, that is a program called Ecamm Live. That's E, if you wanted to, if you wanted to search for it, it's E-C-A-M-M Live. Uh, when I got it, it was a, it was a one-time fee. So you, you bought it and then you had it, you have it forever. Um, unfortunately now you do have to pay a monthly fee, but, uh, considering how easy it is to use and, uh, the features, most of the features I'm not, I'm not even using. Um, but I like to be able to put put the comments up on the screen and stuff. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think it's worth it. What do you think, Sam? I think oh, wait, you, you don't know how to do anything. But I still think it's worth it. <laughs> Jacob Lambert, ask away, man. He wanted to ask a question. He said ooh, it's ooh, important. Ooh. Jacob Lambert. I don't know if how important it is, but let's see if he's setting me up. Ask it, Jacob. All right. Do you want me to begin? You have, you, have a, you have a Willy Wonka golden ticket to ask. Okay. Shameless Shamoon. Sam Shamoon. Sham Wow from the Jersey Shore. Yeah. Uh, Any Tez, question? Tez, uh, I guess you're one of those that believes that the Father is the Most High and Jesus isn't the Most High, though He's God. I know that's the belief of some. That's not biblical. Anytime you guys want to discuss that or invite me to your church and have a discussion about it, I'll be more than happy to do that by the <laughs> grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's this is the. I do believe Jesus is God, yeah. just not mm -hmm. in the way you. Sam Shamoon, the Assyrian Encyclopedia, who knows yeah. pretty much every verse in the Bible uh, from memory. I don't know about that, but, but let's. You let's... know all the references. Okay, but let's, I've, I've, ask... I've seen you. I've, I've, I've seen. Hey, guys, I'll tell you a little story. I don't even remember what the question was. S Sam and I were driving back from Florida, and I've been trying to figure something out. And so I'm driving. And I asked a question. I go, can we say that? I don't even remember. I don't remember what the phrase was. I say, I said, can we say that every time the phrase such and such is used in the Bible and it's not qualified? No, there's no qualifier on it. It always has reference to something like this, right? It was some question like that. And Sam goes, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to go through all the references. And so I assumed that he meant that, you know, eventually we would stop and he would, you know, be at home and he would go through all the references. Right. That's what I thought he meant. But anyway, so that's what he said. And then like 30 seconds goes by and he goes, OK, I went through all the references and what we can conclude. And he just he just goes on to explain every use of it in, in, in the Bible. Right. So he went through all the references of this phrase I brought up in his brain. So anyway, that's anyway, that's part of the reason they call him. The Assyrian Encyclopedia. So then let's begin in prayer before we do that. Right? Yeah, Just, so you say a prayer, and then we're going to get the question amen. from who? We got to. Who uh, we got the question I from? I don't know. Uh, Jacob Lambert. But, yeah, just want to say, let's, right. let's begin, guys, because we need the Lord Jesus Christ. And not just for teaching, to live for Jesus. I really need the Holy Spirit every day, all of us. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. You are the one God. Father, I ask in Jesus' name, please bless this session as you have blessed the previous sessions. Anoint David and I. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Seal us together by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Wash us in the blood of Jesus to be used to glorify Jesus Christ <clears throat> until the Lord takes us home. And bless the people listening. Convict Muslims to see the truth of who Jesus is and the falsehood of Islam. And enable us to speak truth without error and do it from pure heart because we love you, Father. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Please bless it and bring them, Father, to hear this for the glory of your Son and the power of your Holy Spirit. And be with our loved ones, my angels that you've given me in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yep, he says Trinity is false. Yes, because Who said that? Uh, Tez. Because Tez says Trinity is false. Guys, that's it. It's Doug, false. Tez says it. That's it. Tez said it. Pack man. up, go home. Because this man, we've been waiting. The church has been waiting for Tez for 2,000 years to show up to set us straight. Because man. these men and women that came before us, who knew the languages, who loved Jesus passionately, who even died for the glory of Christ, who poured into the scriptures, yeah. they had no clue. Tez, thank you. Now I'm going to say there is no God but Allah, and Tez is his messenger. Tez, thank you. Thank man. you for setting us all right. Uh, wow. Man, what would we do without Tez? Tez, man, Tez. Tez is the man. That's right. He just says it, and it is. He's like Allah. Yep, yeah, exactly. I'm telling you, yeah. exactly. Man, Lord, bring them for your glory. All right, so if Jacob Lambert didn't ask, he said he had an important question. Jacob! 
Where are Ask you, your friend? comment, or we're going to move on. Yeah, because we're going to we're going to try to at least finish the Quran. That the part in the Quran will take long, but we can open a Q and A and let the Spirit just guide us. So if there's Muslims here with serious <clears> challenges, <throat> because again, Christians, uh, although we're here to serve you as well, we do want to give Muslims. This guy keeps asking this question. Do you want to? He this guy. That's all he does. Yesterday for the for the entire two hours, that's all he repeated. What? I would like to invite you to my church. Discuss. The Why are we going to go to your church? No, he's he's a Muslim. He he's the one who brought up yesterday. Why are Mark and John why different? Is he, why is he in a church if he's a Muslim? No, I think he's just pulling our line. Unless he's a Christian asking sincerely, because for two hours in the broadcast yesterday, this gentleman kept saying, why is Mark and John different? Why is Mark and John different? And John is more, the, you know, typical Muslim spiel that they take from liberals. So now he's pretending to be a Muslim. He's, he's just mocking. Let me, uh, right? let me give a quick response. Uh, uh, I would like to invite you to my church to discuss the gospel of John. Um, we uh, humbly reject your offer. Uh, we can't just, you know, we, we we have to have a reason to go to someone's church. And as Sam said, as if you're trolling with stuff, we're just not going to have a lot of interest in that. Uh, if you're wondering why there are differences in the Gospels, yeah. it's because they focus on different things. Thank you. The Gospel writers focus on very different things, right? Uh, Mark focuses a lot on action. Jesus went here, he did this. He went here and did this. And then he went here and they did this. It's, it's very action oriented. Um, Matthew uh, has a lot of the same material as Mark, but he also focuses a lot on Jesus on the sermons of Jesus. He gives, I think, five of Jesus' sermons. So he, he packs those into there. Um, Luke has a special interest in the parables of Jesus. He packs a lot of those in there. And John focuses a lot on interpersonal uh, uh, conversations, you know, with Nicodemus, with Mary, and, and so on. Uh, he focuses on those on those uh, uh, intimate conversations with people. So um, they're, they're writing in different contexts for different purposes, and you're going to get some differences. Imagine, I mean, imagine you spend three years with Sam Shimon, and uh, there are a couple of us who spend time with Sam Shimon, and then we decide to write about the experiences and so on. Um, well, depending on what, what purpose we're writing for and our interests in writing, you could, you could write a lot of different stories about Sam. Like I could focus on what a jerk he is all the time, right? Another person might just fo focus on uh, his theological teachings and so on. So you get all sorts of different results. So anyway, that's about that. Jacob hang on, Lambert that, 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 that. Oh, hang on. Uh, hang on. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to bring this up because this was from yesterday. Um, Triple H said, uh, missed you uh, live with Robert Spencer. Wanted to respond to a claim made by Abdul Lubda on that stream about Sikh grooming gangs. Because, you know, uh, yeah. Sam, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, uh, Muslim um, Internet guys, they like to um, divert the discussion right if you're talking about one thing they try to divert it to another topic so we're talking about islamic grooming gangs so he said what about sikh grooming gangs i said i've never heard of one so they certainly aren't as prominent as the islamic grooming gangs um and so uh yeah i i did i did want to add which i forgot to mention yesterday the only time i've heard about grooming gangs having anything to do with the sikhs was where sikh girls were the victims right that, that was in the uk where he, here's what it would happen um uh, a, a, someone from one of the Muslim grooming gangs would seduce a uh, Sikh teenage girl, right? Uh, wine her, dine her, make make her fall in love with him, eventually get her uh, in some photographs, in some compromising photographs, and now you're the sex slave of anyone we say, and we're going to pimp you out to all our friends and so on, and that's just the way it is. And the Sikh girls are scared to tell their families because uh, they didn't want to bring shame to their families. And so a uh, horrible situation. So uh, Sikhs are, are more commonly the, the victims of these grooming gangs than, uh, than any sort of perpetrators. Yeah. Um, all right. So now, there is a question before we begin. Abdul Rahman, he, I see again. Wait, he, wait, wait. What, what about the guy who asked oh, the question? Oh, yeah. Jacob. Well, his question was more along the lines. How recent asked, is it? Uh, it was way up. Jacob? Uh, right there. I got it right it. here. Yeah, see? he says, yeah. So, and then Abdul Rahman, stick around because I'm going to answer this for the empty time. And Abdul Rahman, <clears> after <throat> today, I'm going to put you on my block list because we've answered the same question for the past two weeks. Uh, is he going to be on my block list because you have no bro no, blocking? No, I'm going to block him you for no me. Blocking, so if you want to watch him, you have I know, no blocking I know. privileges on my channel. FYI, so I, I can't block people from his channel, but I can block block you from me seeing your comment. So that's all I can do. As far as this channel, I can't stop you from. Yeah, I, I kind of. I mean. Uh, Good That's idea right. is, to, is to kind of ignore him because he does prove a point, right? I mean, we we've been talking. I mean, uh, some of these, some of you know, Abdul Rahman, he's he's like the perfect example of the spiritual blindness, right? Beautiful. He can bring up a response, we can completely destroy it, and he'll bring it up again ten minutes later, and we can completely destroy it again, and ten minutes later, it's like it's like talking to a wall, right? It's like talking to a wall. Nothing ever sinks in. And Sam, what was that parable about the 
about sowing the seed? Oh, what, yeah, what, yeah. What's the parable? Remember yeah, the parable? you got four types of soil. One that just falls on the ground, uh-huh. one that falls on the, on the, in the field but doesn't take root. Doesn't take root. Right? And then there's only one that sinks in and mm-hmm. produces a harvest. And so uh, the, the seed that, that falls along the path, the birds right. just come down and eat it up, right? Because it That's doesn't fair. sink into the soil, right? So uh, j- just think about that, right? It's, uh, he's talking about the word, right? He's talking about spreading the word, spreading the truth. And Jesus says that there, it, it, it's it's not the it's not the the seed that's going out, right? It's not the truth. That's it's not it's not simply a matter of the truth that's going out. It's the type of person who's receiving it, right? For some people, they accept it. It sinks in and it bears fruit. For other people, it's like it's like tossing the seed on a hardened path, or on rocky soil, or on uh, shallow soil, where. Um, on the on the on the path, it just sits there, right? It doesn't sink in, never bears any fruit, never goes anywhere. The birds of the air just come down and eat it up, and that's what it's like talking to you, Abdur Rahman. Yeah. Why do we keep doing it? Well, two reasons: one, because you're a perfect example, right? You're, you're an illustration of exactly what Jesus said. Two, we don't always know whether something will eventually sink in, right? Because there are people who you talk to them, 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 you talk to them for years, and then it finally sinks in. So. We're patient. We're patient people. All right. So Jacob says, hi, Sam. Basically, I have Asperger's syndrome and I'm a born again Christian and have emotional religious experiences. I found out I'm related to Muhammad and I'm worried Jesus might judge me for it. Jesus is going to judge you for being related to Muhammad. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, keep in mind, I mean, uh, officially, officially, Nabil Qureshi is from is, is a descendant of Muhammad's tribe. That's what the word Qureshi means. I don't you, you, you can't quite tell if those are true because lots of Muslims down through history would take a name like that, right? And, and if they're traveling to a new, new area where, where no one knows them, they could always take the name in order to, to claim uh, common, common descent from Muhammad's tribe or from Muhammad himself or something like that. Um, but Sam, what do you think? Is he going to be judged by I, Jesus? That, that's, I don't know because he's, uh, what I didn't understand, he said, I have Asperger's and I have uh-huh. religious experiences that I'm related to. Is he saying that it's his religious experiences that caused him to find out? No, it looks like it looks like it looks like these are two different things. Okay. Um, so, so Jacob, we just yeah. wanted to clarify, I right? Know, yeah. I was taking these as separate claims. So, I found out I'm related to Muhammad, right? So, I'm assuming you meant through some, you know, study of your genealogy or something like that. Yeah. If you're saying, are you saying that you found out through your emotional experiences, your experiences. like you had some sort of feeling or, or vision or something like that? Tell because us. That's why I didn't what understand what's the connection with Asperger syndrome. Emotional religious experiences and finding out is related to Muhammad. Your bloodline to Muhammad means nothing. <clears throat> In other words, it's not your physical lineage that will impact or affect your salvation. What affects your salvation is whether you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you reject him. Because even the Bible says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is to the Jew first and then the Greek also. And the reason why I mentioned the Jew first, because the Lord Jesus himself says to the Jews who rejected him, to the Jews who rejected him. <clears throat> I'm not talking about, he, he didn't say this to all Jews. Obviously, his followers were Jewish. His mother, the greatest woman that God created, was Jewish. Jesus is Jewish, God who became a Jewish man. But he says to the Jews that they are not, <clears throat> they don't belong to Abraham. If you go to John 8 and you read 39 of 44, physical Jews who are physical descendants of Abraham, and he says clearly that if they truly belong to their father Abraham, they would act like Abraham. But then he says, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that he's heard from God, Abraham did not do this. So he says, it doesn't matter, Abraham's your physical ancestor. It doesn't matter that you are physical descendants of Abraham. Your rejection of me shows that you're not truly Jews inwardly, spiritually, and you don't truly belong to Abraham. And then he says, who they belong to? You belong to your father, the devil, John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil. What's the point there? Physical lineage is not important. What matters is you're born of the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, united to Jesus Christ by your faith in Him as the Son of God, your Savior, God in the flesh, who came to do for you what you could not do for yourself. That's what matters. So who cares you got the bloodline of Muhammad? The blood of Jesus will cleanse you of that. And again, when I say blood of Christ, we use that expression metaphorically and spiritually. I may have to do a session on why do we say the blood of Jesus cleanses us? Because the blood of Jesus in the New Testament language is simply another way of saying the death of Christ. The blood of Jesus, because when you shed your blood, you die, right? So the death of Christ is what reconciles us to God, brings about forgiveness and redemption. And another way of saying that is the blood of Christ cleanses you from your sins. So anyway, I hope that answered the question. 
I just forgot. Someone else brought up another good point. I was going to answer. But anyway, Abdurrahman's question is good. I do want to take it. Not for him, because it will help us to show that the Hebrew Bible, again, is the foundation of the New Testament, and all the core doctrines of Christianity are taught in the Hebrew Bible. But here's the caveat. In the New Testament, you find a more complete, more fuller, more perfect understanding of the doctrines already taught in the Hebrew Bible. For example, with the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then the New Testament becoming the inspired record of those events. The New Testament is the inspired inscripturation, the record of those two amazing earth-shattering events. Jesus becoming flesh and the Spirit being poured out upon believers, forming the Church of Christ. <clears throat> what you have with the, with the coming of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit, is now a more fuller, more complete understanding of what was in the Old Testament. What do I mean? If I go with the Old Testament, I can demonstrate clearly God is multi-personal. I can show you that this one God is not a singular person. But to <clears throat> articulate the exact relationship between these divine persons, I would need the more fuller, complete revelation of the New Testament to do that, because like I said in the previous session, there's only one explicit passage. One passage that's explicit. God has a divine son that is essentially co-equal to him. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 3 and 4. Other passages are in, the, in reference to Jesus' messianic role because the kings of Israel were called the sons of God. When they took the throne, they became God's royal sons, empowered by God, by His Spirit, to rule righteously. And if they failed to rule righteously, then God would either <clears throat> punish them or reject them and bring in another king. So the kings of Israel were God's sons in that sense. So Jesus as the son of David would be a son of God in that sense and the ultimate son of God in that royal sense. But again, he asked a question that I do want to answer. The worship of Jesus the son goes against the Old Testament. That's basically what he said. Worshiping the son goes against the Old Testament. Well, even if that was true, number one, it doesn't go against the Old Testament. Right. At most, you would prove that the Old Testament is silent about it. It doesn't go against it. It's simply silent at most. Number two, if it did go against the Old Testament, you just condemn Jesus again as a false Messiah. Because Jesus taught, Abdul Rahman, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I hope it sinks in. Jesus taught, the historical Jesus taught, and it's not just in John. You'll find it in Matthew as well. That and Mark and Luke as well, not just John. And how do we find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Because by claiming to be the Son of Man that the prophet Daniel saw, Jesus was claiming to be that divine being worthy of worship. Jesus taught that He is the Son who is worthy of the same worship that the Father receives. So if it contradicts the Old Testament, that means Jesus contradicts the Old Testament. He's a false Messiah. But Muhammad said He's a true Messiah. That means Muhammad is also a false prophet. So I don't know what you're trying to prove. So, But with that said, there are Old Testament passages where the coming Messiah is worshipped as God. The most clear passage, the clearest passage, is the one that we always bring up. David brings it up. I bring up almost every apologist under, you know, in the planet that deals with Muslims brings this passage up. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. So let me just show a couple of passages in the Hebrew Bible. And by the way, I want to correct Cloudy. It's four types of soil, not six. It's in Mark 4. Let's not debate on something irrelevant in split errors. It's four, not six. But if you wanted six, okay, you can have six. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. One like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. The oldest Jewish interpretation of this figure is that this is the Messiah. How do I know? The book of Enoch, a Jewish book, not a Christian one, and for Ezra, a Jewish book, not a Christian one, identify this son of man of Daniel as the Messiah, the son of God. So live with it. Anyway, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations, not some, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. All nations, that means all the Muslim nations, every people group in existence must worship the Son of Man. So you either do it now, voluntarily, and be saved, or when he comes, you will be forced to do it, but then it'll be too late because that act of worship won't be an act showing your <clears throat> trust in him. 
resulting salvation, but that he has now humbled you and brought you beneath his feet before he sends you off to punishment. But all nations and peoples of every language worship him. The verb pilach is the verb used in Daniel for the worship given to God alone. So this son of man figure is to be worshipped forever by all nations and all peoples. That means all you Muslims, Muhammad himself, must shall and will eventually worship Jesus because Jesus claims to be that Son of Man, that Messiah. Now, I can give more verses, but I guess I'll just hold off because there's other passages in the Hebrew Bible. But again, that wasn't our topic. <clears throat> now, now watch Abdurrahman repeat the same question yes. an hour from now. Yeah, shocker. That Oh, yeah, Jesus, you know, said worship the Father. He didn't say, okay. Hard soil, hard soil, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> um, Karas here said, uh, hey, guys, I asked this question yesterday. Why are Muslims quick to reject some Sirah or Hadith like Ibn Ishaq, even though it is the earliest biography we have. Um, there, there, there are multiple reasons here on why people reject um, sources. Uh, most Muslims in the West who reject sources, they're simply rejecting because they don't like what the source says, right? So they've been trained to say, when you bring up something about Muhammad and it's embarrassing, just say, oh, that's a weak source. So they just mindlessly do it um, with, without any respect for whether it is historical or not. So that's, that's, that's the most common reason. If you're talking about um, why people would reject Ibn Ishaq uh, from the perspective of Islamic methodology, what you had in the first couple centuries of Islam was that there were competing methodologies. There were competing methodologies. Uh, you had your, your, your Sira guys, right? And, and their method was you could simply trace something back to some authoritative uh, speaker, right? You could, you could say, oh, uh, so-and-so said this in the first century of Islam, and they would treat that as, well, if, if that guy said it and he's, uh, and he's good as gold, then we can trust what he said. So that was their methodology. Um, but later, the, the Hadith scholars began consolidating a methodology, right? And their, their methodology centered around Isnad criticism, where you, you say, uh, I got this story from so-and-so who got it 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 from a companion of Muhammad. And they became convinced that this is the only acceptable methodology. For a while, you had both of these methodologies competing side by side. Eventually, the Hadith guys won, right? They won the, they won the battle in Islam on, on whose methodology was, was the official methodology of Islam, eventually, after a couple centuries. Once that happened, then the then Muslims would look back and say, "Oh, Ibn Asak, he doesn't follow the the same the same methodology of Bukhari, so we can't trust what he says, even though he's writing much earlier, even though he's writing much earlier, and uh, it, most most non-Muslim scholars would consider his material far more reliable than what you re than what you read in Bukhari. But since Muslims absorb the idea that it's inherently just less reliable because it's not following Isnad criticism." Uh, then it would be rejected on, on those grounds. As far as rejecting hadith, uh, as I said, they, Muslims have their methods where they will, they will look at a list of names to see whether this can be trusted. Uh, and they would look at the list of names and they have a methods where, uh, oh, this person in this list of eight names in this chain of narration, uh, that guy we're calling into, into question there. And so we can't really know if we can trust this. And so they come up with, with different ways of classifying hadiths, whether they're uh, strong or weak or somewhere in between. So uh, hope that helps. Yeah. By the way, it is a horrible, ridiculous methodology. Name a historian anywhere in the world who uses hadith criticism. I mean, who uses is the Isnad methodology. No one does that. They use, yeah. they use various um, uh, historical principles. That's what historians use. Your average historian, your average non-Muslim historian would regard it's not criticism method as a joke. Um, and, and by the way, Sam, isn't there a kind of circularity to that method, that, that methodology? Are you paying attention? No, is there a kind of circularity to the of method of it's not criticism? No, it's perfectly valid. What are you talking about? You're just a white <laughs> kafir. But yeah, of course it's circular. Man. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because even the chain of transmission is found in that very narration. So to prove the narration, you have to prove it by the chain of transmission. But the chain of transmission is dependent on that narration. Yeah. Did, 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 you, did you all catch that? So suppose we're starting off right here and we want to know um, whether we can trust a story about Muhammad. According to the methodology, I can only know if I can trust this story based on whether I can trust all of the names in the chain of transmission. But how do I know if I can trust all of those people? Of I would have to know about all of those people, right? But how do I can't. know about all of those people? 
by trusting people. stories about them that I've heard or something like that? Well, no. In, in order to know that I, if I can trust those people, I would have to know if if I have a reliable story about those people being reliable, and I would have to trust that chain of narration. Well, how do I know I can trust all the people yeah. in that chain of narration? I would have to have some. You see, it, it, it's never ending, right? Sad. It's an absurd, ridiculous methodology. It's the best that that Muslim scholars came up with is ridiculous, but Muslims became obsessed with the idea that that is the only way to do history. And that's why, uh, Here that's, you go again. that's why no one goes to the Islamic world to, to learn how to do history. Uh, Just like no one goes to the Islamic world to learn science or anything else, even though the Quran is a fount of science and learning. You're very excited right now. Our <laughs> friend Tez is here to try to d die. Uh, I did want to bring. I did want to bring up this comment by, uh, by, no, by, no, by, no, by Ben Wagner. I, no, no, I'm just going to mention it. I'm just going to mention. It, then you're right. going to you're gonna respond to Tez. So Ben said, uh, Ben said, guys, please don't let the trolls distract you from the stated topic. Exactly. That's probably their goal. I strongly doubt they are sincere, seeking answers okay. to questions you have re-answered dozens of times. Now, they mean to waste time. This confirms what I want to say. Tez needs to go. He's been here for the past 10 minutes talking about the Trinity. Why? Why don't you ignore him? Distracting us because he's distracting he's other people. He's not distracting me. I'm ignoring him. He's it. distracting people because now they're talking about the Trinity. That's oh. what I'm trying to say. It's up to you, man. It's your channel. We'll see. I'll have to, okay. I'll have to take a look. Oh, yeah, but 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 Ben, I just wanted to, I just wanted to respond. Um, at the beginning of a live stream, at the beginning of a live stream, we don't mind taking some questions because people aren't on yet. In other That's words, right. if you if you look ten minutes in, ten minutes into a live stream, there's like 250 people on. Right? People are still logging on because some people they're waiting. They're waiting at the beginning. Uh, other people aren't waiting, but they get a notification. Hey, these guys are live, and so they start clicking on it. So usually, twenty to thirty minutes, you have a you yeah, have a, a big group yeah. assembled yeah. before we get into our topic. Um, so yeah, so you want to jump into the topic, or you want to just uh, address yeah, some no, other? Yeah, well, I just see yeah, a couple more. But like I said, uh, just maybe Tez is listening. Tez, do not come here with your agenda to preach your heresy. We're taught we have a topic. You don't like the Trinity? You can go somewhere else, friend. But that's one point. Secondly, someone asked me what passage I was citing. It was Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. The Son of Man is worship, a worship given to God alone, because the Aramaic verb pirach is only used in the positive sense for the worship due to God. And when you give pirach, that's the Aramaic verb again, pirach, to someone other than God, it's condemned. You can read that in Daniel chapter 3 where... Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego refused to give Pilach to the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they even said, we will only give Pilach to our God and to no other gods. So again, positively, Pilach is to be given to God alone. That God would then allow all nations, not for some period of time, forever, to give Pilach to the Son of Man. The Son of Man must be equal to God in glory, in honor, majesty, and essence. And since Daniel does not believe in more than one God, how do I know Daniel doesn't believe more than one God? Because in Daniel chapter 9, you guys write down the references, verse 11 and verse 13, he, he mentions the curses, the judgment, written in the law of Moses that would befall the nation if they proved unfaithful to the covenant. Since Daniel knows about the law of Moses, has read the law of Moses, then he clearly knows that in Moses, the only God that Israel can worship, the other nations, if they want to worship other gods, that's between them and God on the day of judgment. As an Israelite, the only one that is to be worshipped, according to the writings of Moses, is Yahovah, or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce it, because he says that in Exodus 34, 14, right? Even in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5, and then if you go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and then you read verse 13, Yahweh alone is the object of the worship of Israel. So they were supposed to be monolatrous, monolatry, meaning the worship of only one God. For then Daniel to be given a vision where a distinct divine figure in human appearance, because that's what it means, one like a son of man. He's more than human. He is God, but in human semblance, to be given that worship, he has to be one with the true God, Otherwise, Daniel is violating the law of Moses. So I hope that's clear. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And he makes reference to the law of Moses in Daniel 9, verse 11 and verse 13. So just to reiterate that point. Um, all right. A uh, couple more questions. And then, Sam, uh, I'd like you first to review your point from yesterday. Okay. Uh, uh, give us the basic idea before we go on to the uh, the other the other part of Islam's 
Trinity. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, because you know people people sometimes get mad. Hey, you didn't you didn't get to my comment, David. You ignored my comment, uh, guys. I see maybe five percent of the comments if on a on a good day they come. They are scrolling through here rapid fire, and I can uh, if I start basically if I start reading them carefully. By the time I I find one to put up on the screen that that we definitely want to answer. Uh, there are like hundreds more. And so I basically sometimes just have to have to skip tons to uh, to even try to keep up. Um, but here's one. Uh, and, and here we're not going to actually going to answer this right now, but uh, we're going to invite you to tune in tomorrow because uh, so the question is, can you please give us the exact numbers of I guess you mean ayahs uh, of the Quran and Muhammad that oh, disproves tonight. itself like the one you always say uh, his aorta wa yes. was cut. So if you're talking about the, the ref, the, the Quran references, um, that have to do with uh, Muhammad, uh, Allah saying that he would sever Muhammad's aorta. That's 69, 44 to 46. Seven. Yeah, 46, yeah, 47. 47. Include 47 yeah. at all. Um, so that's uh, Surah 69 verses 44 to 46 47. or 47. And as far as the Hadith, I just want to say uh, Christian Prince is going to be on with us tomorrow and we're going to be revisiting that topic because we told Muslims that we would be, be revisiting that topic and with, that we would give them plenty of time to yeah. come in and respond. So we're going to revisit that topic and the topic of Muhammad uh, having his adopted son's wife. We said we'd revisit these topics. Right. So we're going to revisit them with Christian Prince in case anyone has some questions about the Arabic behind these things. And we can get to the bottom of these things. Man, I need a shave. By the way, Serena Dadu, that sounds like an Assyrian last name. If you're Assyrian, give me a shout out. Are you Assyrian? Dadu. She may be Middle Eastern. Indeed, Surya. Just to say, I am a Syrian. A lot of Syrians who are born of the Spirit. Praise Jesus Christ. Now, you want me to give a quick rundown of the argument? One, what do you one, want me to do? One quick response, and then, give right. you, and then give you a thing. Come on, guys. We want to go over a 1,000 by the grace of Jesus. Come on. I Kelly, love big numbers. Kelly says, I often wonder why miracles don't happen like they did in biblical times. Um, two things. One, miracles are pretty rare even in biblical times, right? They, 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 if you look at the Old Testament, they happen, but they're rare. But you're covering thousands of years of history there. Right? Um, during the time of Jesus, you, you have a lot of miracles during the time of Jesus. But uh, the point is, even even in the time of the Bible, miracles are, are pretty rare occurrences. So uh, so that's one thing. The other part is, if you if you go with if, if you go with actual data on people who believe they've witnessed miracles. Miracles are, are far more common today. Uh, and the reason I say that is you, you can look at uh, Craig Keener's uh, two-volume set on miracles where um, he actually went and, and researched people who claim that they have witnessed miracles. Uh, but basically, Pew Research, Pew Research did a study. They uh, took a poll of uh, one denomination of Christianity in 10 countries, just 10 countries out of all the countries in the world, and there were already around 200 million people who believe they've witnessed miracles, right? Something they cannot explain apart from God performing a miracle in their midst. So keep in mind, this was one denomination in just 10 countries, and they were already, they already had around 200 million people who believe that they have witnessed miracles. So if you if you think, okay, that's just 10 countries in one denomination, what if you included all denominations in all countries, Looks like you're going to be well over a billion people in this world who are convinced that they have witnessed a miracle. Doesn't mean they're all right, but if they're all wrong, that is that is a that's a lot of people who whose eyes are deceiving them because they believe they've actually witnessed a miracle. So um, I don't think that that miracles are necessarily less common now than they are in uh, yeah, than yeah. they were. Praise God! She is an Assyrian. Her father is Syrian, and her mother Armenian. Praise Jesus Christ! Two great nations running Syrians. in your veins. Wow! Praise Jesus! More Assyrians are coming to know Jesus. When I say, let me qualify that. Some Assyrians may get offended because Assyrians are born into Christian families. What I mean is Assyrians choosing to walk in the love and fellowship of Jesus Christ. Yes, love? you can be an Assyrian. You and all your Assyrian friends are like the meanest people I've ever met yeah, in my well, life. because we have to deal with people like you that always think that you're superior and high and mighty. We have to humble you because we are the rod of God's anger. Isaiah chapter 10, the rod of God's anger, humbling people like him who get on their horse. We have to bring them down. What I mean is that there are a lot of Assyrians now who are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're born of the Spirit and are in love with Jesus. Praise Jesus. I pray more Assyrians walk in the love of Jesus Christ and are empowered by the Spirit. And I pray that for every one of you. But it's, it's exciting to see my own. And yeah, praise the Lord, sister. Find me on Facebook. And all you Assyrians, find me on Facebook. I want to find you guys. 
I'm traveling the world, and hopefully I'll get to re meet all of you in time by the grace of Jesus. All right, so uh, uh, Debbie adds, I have witnessed miracles, and Cheryl says, uh, search for the case for miracles by Lee Strobel on YouTube as well. So just some uh, resources there for you, Kelly. And I just wanted to add... Um, uh, what what you one of the, one of the interesting things is uh, the, ha, where miracles are more common. Yeah. It's in, it's kind of it's usually in places where they need it. And I, I Sam, I, I've noticed a parallel, right? When when uh, the the Israelite the children of Israel were traveling to the Promised Land, and manna is being rained down from from heaven yeah. to feed them. It says when they got to the as soon when they got to the Holy Land, as soon as they they got the fruits of the land. Then the manna stopped. Exactly. Right. So, so no, the notice there. Stopped. Yeah. Notice there. You're in the desert. You need it. You have nothing. Then God provided. When they got to the Holy Land and they could get it by natural means, God stopped the the the, the miraculous stuff. The reason I say that is, in places like the West where we're blessed with with good hospitals and healthcare and things like that, compared to many other countries in the world, uh, yeah, you don't you don't see as many you don't hear about as many uh, miraculous occurrences. Uh, the places you you that these things are more common are in places that uh, that need it. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is uh, they're, they're, they're more they're more common in places where the gospel is, is going out and being preached to, pe to people who've never heard it before. The, the, the estimates are, depending on the area of China, between 50 and 90 percent of new converts to Christianity in China converted after believing that they have witnessed a miracle in the name of Jesus. Right. Someone. So they're sick and someone shows up, lays hands on them and they're healed. That Oh, I want to convert to this. So you're talking 50 to 90 percent of the people. Um, who are converting in China is because of witnessing miracles. Anyway, it just goes all, yeah. all back to you. I, I, again, I don't yeah, think yeah. you can say. We're going to have to uh, come back I, to that talk. But I want to say, I, by the grace of Jesus, I've overcome my fear of flying. I'm not afraid anymore because someone said that's a miracle. That miracle this. has already been performed. Glory to Jesus. That miracle has already been performed. I love to fly now, and I'm flying the world by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, if there's if there aren't any questions, recap, recap for okay, yesterday, because we got to because I want to make sure you get this argument, folks. One thing I want you to do with these shows that we're doing, whether it's me or David or David or Anthony, whoever, learn the arguments, <clears throat> make it second nature, use them in your witness. I promise you, these are arguments we have used in the field. I call it battle tested arguments because we are field in a spiritual tested. battle. So it's battle tested arguments in the field. We have tested them. There are no good objections. Of course, they're going to bring an objection, yeah. but there are no good objections. Yeah. The evidence is overwhelming. They don't know what to do with it. And pray the Holy Spirit will use this to convict them to fall in love with Jesus. But please use the arguments. We're not here just to entertain and tickle your ears. I know some of you are enjoying these sessions, especially the bantering, the back and forth between David and I. But we're not here to entertain you. We don't want it to be boring. We want to educate you so that you can be emboldened by the Spirit. Preach. Muslims need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christians need to be inoculated from Islam. Do your part for the glory of Christ in spreading the kingdom. So, to recap, what I'm going to demonstrate is what I call Islam's counterfeit trinity. I don't believe Allah of the Quran is the true God. I don't believe the trinity of Islam is the true trinity. It's a satanic counterfeit. But nonetheless, there is a trinity in the Quran. And this will put a Muslim in such a situation that if he keeps saying that we're polytheists, we're not monotheists, then he or she must be consistent and condemn Islam as polytheistic. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If I can demonstrate conclusively, your Quran teaches a multiplicity of divine entities, then either the gig is up, Islam is not Unitarianism, there is no Tawheed, even the, the root for Tawheed is to unify I, irony of ironies. The word Tawheed comes from a root, Wahda, which means to unify. Even that word doesn't teach solitariness, right? It, it teaches unification. But with that said, once I show you this evidence, the Muslim cannot attack the Trinity as being contrary to monotheism. In fact, I remember not too long ago, David, on a pal talk debate, I don't know why a Christian agreed to this. A Christian agreed to debate a Muslim on the topic Trinity versus monotheism. Are you serious? Christians, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Let me chide you in a loving manner. Why would you accept the topic Trinity versus monotheism? Because in agreeing, you're admitting yeah. that the Trinity is not monotheistic. That's that, that's like agreeing to a topic like Christianity or the truth. You know, uh, <laughs> right? don't do that. No, please <laughs> don't fall for that. It's Trinitarianism versus Unitarianism. Mm. 
Trinity versus Unitarianism. But Trinity is monotheistic. So don't acquiesce or fall for the, the tricks uh, and the gimmicks, the, the trickery of the Muslims. Please don't do that. Now that said, in the Quran and Islamic tradition, I have to also include Islamic tradition, you have Allah, the Quran, and the Spirit. I can introduce Jesus as well. So we'd have a we would we would have a quadrinity, but I'm going to stick to the Quran, Allah, and the Spirit. Why am I speaking to, sticking to the Quran? Because Muslims themselves concede the fact the Quran is uncreated by nature. For me to show them that the Quran teaches the same about Jesus, they'll say, "No, you're twisting it." The Quran clearly says he's just a servant, and there are passages. Where it says Jesus is just a servant, but then it contradicts itself, showing he's more than that. Allah, the Quran, and the Spirit. Now, if you go back to yesterday's session, I already uh, provided the evidence. The Spirit of Allah, it's not part of creation, comes out of Allah because it says Allah breathed the Spirit. So it comes out of Him, and if it's a part of Him, it can't be created. Unless you believe there are parts of Allah that are temporal and came later into existence, right? So Allah is a composite being an imperfect. Breathe out by Allah. Subordinate to Allah, the messenger of Allah, who can speak and be spoken to, because according to chapter 19 of the Quran, verses 16 to 21, the spirit appeared as a man, a perfect looking man, and had a conversation with Mary. And this spirit gives life, creates life, caused Mary to get pregnant, animated Adam, made him a living soul. And the spirit is om omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, because he can be with all Muslims, because the Quran says the Muslims are the believers. So he's with all believers the world over to strengthen them in their faith. Clearly, this spirit is a subordinate divine person because he's subject to Allah. He's Allah's messenger. But he is truly God because he can do what only God is supposed to do. So I already established that yesterday. What I want to establish tonight, God willing. And I have done talks on this on my own channel for other, for, for other people. I have articles on this. The Quran, believe it or not, according to the authentic sources of Sunni Islam. And this is the position of what's known as Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. I like to say that. I like to impress people with the Arabic I don't know. Yeah. Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. I mean, this is the position of the people of the Sunnah. And this is the, the view of the ulama, the Muslim scholars. Right? It's not even the majority. There is no Sunni Muslim who can deny this. If he does, you'll see if, if the right Muslims get a hold of him, his head will be one place and his body will be somewhere else. You have to believe this if you're a Sunni. What must you believe? The Quran is uncreated. It's beginningless. It's always existed. The Quran is not Allah, but it's not other than Allah. Let me repeat that again, because I know it's going to be hard for people to even understand what that means. The Muslims say the attributes of Allah, Safat, and the Quran is one of his attributes. It's his speech. The Arabic is kalam, kalam Allah, the word speech of Allah. The attributes of Allah are not Allah, but they're not other than Him. So the Quran is not Allah, but it's not other than Allah. What in the world does that mean? We'll get to that in a minute. The Quran is not Allah, and yet it's uncreated. The Quran also has a dual, <clears throat> two natures, because it's not just uncreated. It has another nature that's temporal and created finite. It's a book. The Quran is a book, and the Quran even says it's a book because in chapter 5, just to give you one of many verses, chapter 5, verse 48, it says, To you, Muhammad, we sent down the book, Kitab. So the Quran is a book, but the book that you hold, the, and it's got to be in Arabic, by the way, the Arabic Quran, the book that has the Arabic Quran, that is finite, that is temporal, that is created. But the Quran itself is uncreated. So that means the Quran has two natures, folks. Is this starting to sound like what Christians believe about Jesus? In fact, even scholars, both Muslims and non-Muslims, admit the Islamic view of the Quran is the Christian view of Jesus. Christians believe the eternal word became flesh, physical. Muslims believe the eternal word became physical, but it became a book. And the term they came up with is in libration. In libration, the word become book. Whereas we have incarnation, incarnate, in the flesh. So what we believe about Jesus is what the traditional Muslim position is about the Quran. Now, does that mean the Quran is a living, conscious being? Yeah. Because when you think of the Quran, you're thinking, oh, it's just a book. It's not alive. It's not conscious. Oh, contraire. Now, let's start, get, unless you want me to take a question before I go in. You like that, oh, contraire, right? 
no, no, no. I just, I just know where you're going. So that was, right, okay. I, I like that. I, I, let, 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 let me respond to one. Let me respond to one real quick. Yeah. So name said, uh, David. The word in hadith is abhar. Word in sixty nine forty four is watin. But Sam Zawadi has that. detailed article refuting you on aortic claim. Notice, um, guys, we pointed out. We wait. YouTube channel Truth Shall Prevail also refuted you on this. Watch it. I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, Muslims often have a different definition of refute or refutation from the rest of us. When they say refute, when they say refutation, they mean someone has said something in response to you, and whether it really refutes you or not, no one cares. But as long as they have said something in response to what you have said, that is a refutation. That is not what most of us mean by the word refutation. Notice the reasoning here, right? You've got two different words. They both refer to the aorta, right? Because the aorta can be called different things. It can be called the life artery. It can be called the aorta and so on. Yeah. So notice this will, this will be, this will be this reasoning here, right? Here's a bottle of water, right? Suppose Allah had said, suppose Allah had said, if Muhammad delivers a false revelation, he will choke to death. He will choke to death on H2O. And then Muhammad as he's as he's a, as he's dying, says, "Oh, I'm choking to death on water," and then dies. Right? Notice. So, you so Allah says yourself. he's going to die from choking to death on on H2O, and then Muhammad says, "I'm choking to death. I'm dying from water." Right? And we would say, "My goodness, Allah said that's exactly how he's going to die," and then that's exactly how he died. Amazing. And then what would the response from Muslim apologists be? No. no. H2O is one term for water, and water is a different term for water. So these aren't talking about the same thing. Wow. Anyway, Naeem, be, be sure to bring that objection up tomorrow. We're, we're, we're I don't know why you're bringing it up. I don't know why you're bringing it up. We specifically said we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. We're going to be talking about it tomorrow. Sam Shamoon. Christian Prince, D. Wood, we're gonna we're, we're gonna be focusing on that, right? We're right now we're talking. I I can't believe this. We're talking about a Trinity within your scriptures that you and your scholars ignore. You claim to be the champions of Unitarianism. He's saying that it's false. The claim that Islam is actually Unitarian is completely false. If we take your scriptures seriously, I would assume you'd want to respond to that. Instead, you're saying, "Oh, let me let's go with the topic. We're bringing up tomorrow." And by the way, I forgot to answer Andy Shannon real quickly. Andy Shannon, just because Enoch is extra biblical doesn't mean you cannot appeal to it. And I want to educate Christians real quickly. Jude chapter 1, it's only one chapter, 25 verses. But in verses 14, 15, he cites a prophecy from Enoch. He says, Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied. And it's a verbatim, nearly verbatim citation of what's found in the book of Enoch, the book of Watchers, which was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Chapter 1, verse 9. So Jude himself alludes to the book of Enoch. All throughout the New Testament, you have allusions to the book of Enoch. To say that it's extra-biblical, you should ignore it, shows, again, an ignorance of how the Bible functions. The Bible writers, Old Testament and New Testament, would often appeal to extra-biblical sources, provided those sources contain accurate information, historical information, or said things that help them make their point, make their case, argue their position. Paul himself cites Greek pagans in Acts 17, 28. He says, as even one of your own poets said, we are all the offspring of God. Which, ironically, in the context, folks, that Greek poet was talking about Zeus. So he took a statement that a Greek poet made about Zeus, and then he applied it to the true God, because what's said about Zeus doesn't apply to Zeus. It only applies to the true God. So here you have the New Testament writers appealing to extra-biblical sources, even sources by pagans, to make their point, to argue their position, to argue for the truth of Christianity. In the Old Testament, how many of you guys, when you've read through Kings and, and Samuel and Chronicles, how many, how many times have you heard that the writer refers to the book of Jasher or the Chronicles of the Wars of Yahweh, Yahovah? Where are those books? They're not there. Even Luke chapter 1 says that Luke carefully sifted, investigated, examined sources, both oral and written. So please don't use that as an objection, Christians. Let's be biblically literate. Let's not use that as an objection. Now, with that said, with that said, are we ready to show that the Quran is a conscious living being, this thing from Allah, and the problems that, that Muslims have? And by the way, Abdurrahman and every one of you, please, you need to respond to my arguments. Do not tell me, well, Jesus said worship the Father only. That's not the topic. The topic is, 
Your Quran is a divine entity, a divine being distinct from Allah, yet you say Allah's one. Let's and, talk about and it. And by the way, just again, notice how dumb this is, guys. Jesus said, worship the Father. Great. Then Jesus said that Islam is false because in, according to the Quran, Allah is not a father. Yeah. So Jesus said, do not worship Allah. You Muslims are telling us that over and over and over again like a beating drum. So you're telling us that according to Jesus, Islam is completely false. Thank you. Exactly. Right. Let's begin. According to Muhammad, on the day of judgment, the Quran will intercede for Muslims, will go before Allah and intercede for Muslims before Allah, showing that the Quran is different from Allah and can speak to Allah. Let me bring out the implication again. According to these sound narrations, this one comes from Sai Muslim, the Quran will intercede with Allah on behalf of Muslims, showing that the Quran is in conversation with Allah. Quran speaks to Allah, intercedes before Allah, so it shows it's personally distinct from Allah. Let's read it. Sahih Muslim, and this is all in my articles. I linked to them yesterday. I'll link to them again for this session. Sahih Muslim, Book 4, number 1757. Abu Umama, Yo Mama. Abu Umama said, He heard Allah's Messenger say, Recite the Quran. For on the day of resurrection, it will come as an intercessor for those who recite it. A Shafi, an intercessor for those who recite it. Then it says something interesting. Not only does the Quran intercede, but individual chapters of the Quran intercede. Recite the two bright ones. Al-Baqarah, chapter 2. Surat al-Ali Imran, chapter 3. Recite chapters 2 and 3. Why? For on the day of resurrection, they will come as two clouds, or two shades, or two flocks of birds in ranks, pleading for those who recite them. Recite Surah al-Baqarah, for to take recourse to it is a blessing, and to give it up is a cause of grief, and the magicians cannot confront it. So understand, the Quran itself intercedes, so it speaks to Allah. So there's a conversation, Quran Allah speaking. And then two chapters of the Quran will appear individually as flocks of bird and also speak to Allah and intercede for those who recited it. Now, side issue, David. Is it not true that Muhammad recited the satanic verses where Alat and Uzamanat were called Gharanik? Gharanik is the Arabic word for high-flying cranes, birds, who soar high to intercede. And isn't it ironic that he says that about chapters 2 mm -hmm. and 3? Can you help us see the problem here? Yeah, guys, uh, What I, I want to say what you really find in Islam is Muhammad is uh, taking the teachings of pagans and replacing <laughs> them with his yeah. own teachings that are supposedly doing the exact same thing, right? So think about this because it's a perfect parallel, right? Uh, we've talked about many times before, and we will talk about many times in the future, the satanic verses where Muhammad delivered a revelation saying that Alat, Alus, and Manat are the exalted cranes, these birds whose intercession is to be hoped for. They're these birds that would intercede, and they're, they're intermediaries between you and Allah. So here you are, here's Allah way up here, physical being, and the birds, you could pray to them because they could carry our prayers up to Allah. Every Muslim in the world would recognize that as paganism, polytheism. What does Muhammad say is, going, is, is replacing that? Well, now you have the Quran, and individual chapters of the Quran are going to be flocks of birds, flocks of birds who are going to intercede for you. This is Muhammad, right? This is Muhammad. So uh, these these birds are going to be they're, they're, these birds are, are are paying attention to what you do and how how often you recite them. They're keeping records of uh, they're like Santa Claus. They're, they, they're paying attention to when you're naughty and nice, and they're going to go to Allah on the day of judgment and tell him what you've been doing. Notice, do you see the parallel here? Do you see the parallel? There are these birds that are going to fly to Allah to tell him what you've do, what you've been doing. Now, now, Sam, why, why in the name of common sense would Muslims say that when you believe in Alat, Alus, and Manat, when you believe in Alat, Alus, and Manat as intercessors, these birds who will, who will go to Allah and intercede for you, that's paganism. But when it's surahs of the Quran that are birds flying to Allah to intercede for you, that's not paganism. That's pure monotheism. Because it's a speech of Allah. It's a part yeah, it's, of it's, 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 it's just you? like worshiping in the Kaaba, right? If, if Muslims saw anyone bowing down to anything, right? If they saw someone bowing down to this water bottle, they would say, that's paganism. And what if someone said, no, 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 we're just using this as a common direction. They would say, it's paganism. Stop bowing down to that thing. 
But what do Muslims do? We're all going to bow down to this cubicle shrine. We're going to go up and we're going to smooch this black stone. There's a pagan, it was a pagan idol. We're going to keep smooching it. And it's not paganism when we do it, right? So notice what Islam does. It just says, oh, here are all the things you pagans like. Let's keep some of the same things and let's replace others with things like the Quran and so on. But we'll keep all of the pagan teachings, all of the pagan practices. We'll wrap it up in one big ball and we'll call it pure monotheism. Tawheed, the unification. We're unifying all of this pagan nonsense into our religion and we're going to call it Pure monotheism, no matter what anyone says, no matter how pagan, no, no matter how pagan all of this is, it's just pure monotheism. We're going to stomp our feet and just say it over and over again. Welcome to Islam. By the way, just real quickly, we'll respond later. Abdurrahman, Sam, okay, you proved the divinity of spirit and book. Thank you for admitting it. Whoa, so what? Kid. Awesome. <laughs> but so what? So what, David? So what if you proved that Islam has its so own what? trinity and that our book is, wait, wait, Sam, Sam, Sam. So you've proved you've proven the the deity of the spirit and the book, yeah. and as you've pointed out, the spirit, though divine, is distinct from Allah. Allah sends the spirit, the right? Messenger of Allah. Yeah. So the spirit is sent by Allah and is nevertheless somehow one with Allah, right? And Allah's book is co-eternal with Allah, also proceeds from within Allah, and it is distinct from Allah. And yet it is also a conscious agent. And not only is it a conscious agent, it's a multi-personal conscious agent, right? And we're going to unpack that too. Yeah. Muslims have this huge problem with the God of Christianity, the God of the Bible being multi-personal. And yet, as Sam is about to point out in more detail, oh, yeah. the Quran itself is not just personal. Like the Quran itself is going to show it's up and intercede, as you're going to show, a pale man. It shows up as a That's pale right. man to intercede. But it's also multi-personal within the Quran itself. So yeah. you've got Allah, which is God, who sends the Spirit, who is also God, and from within Allah proceeds His Word, His eternally, it has the attributes of Allah, it's also conscious and will intercede, and the Quran, which intercedes for you and appears as a pale man, itself is multi-personal, so that if you only had the Quran, you'd still have a multi-personal being, and the response from Muslims, so what? <laughs> we, don't, we don't see you a problem here. You follow what you don't, we don't encompass see, in knowledge. We don't see any problem here. Wait, but there, there's more evidence against you. You go with what is unclear and leave what is clear. See, that's it. Okay, well, at least you admit I'm right. I'm not lying. But let, uh, we're, let, it's going to get better. The Quran also worships Allah. You got another question? Uh, I just wanted to you address this. If anyone knows whether this is serious or not, because we, we know that people do say things that are, that are false just to try and distract us. But if there's... It, you know, we don't always know because we don't. Oh no, this guy's a mocker. Is he? Oh yeah. Arnold says, He's "Okay, I prayed, guys. I did it, and it was wonderful. My sister and I tried to pray to Jesus, and no, the feeling was overwhelming. Don't waste your time with this guy. But we, sister and I, can't leave Islam because of our parents. Yeah, no, he was mocking yesterday. He was mocking earlier. He's one of those Muslims. He's just playing games. Have you changed? Yeah, no, he's he's. Is, he's... is this what your religion teaches? If you're just mocking? Yeah, that's what he's doing. All yeah. right, we'll see. Okay, anyway, now coming back, it gets better because I'm going to show you that the Quran even addresses Allah as its Lord. But here, let's go. Now, not only does the surahs appear individually, let me read two more narrations. Again, to reiterate that this is not an isolated narration. You'll find this in the Islamic corpus, narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr. This comes from Jami Tirmidhi, Jami Tirmidhi, hadith number 1963. This is all online, by the way. Narrated Abdullah ibn Amr. Allah's Messenger said fasting. And by the way, I have an article where Muhammad believed everything had consciousness. The stars, this, everything. Trees, trees would greet him. Ya Rasulullah, the trees, food would speak to him as he's eating it. There's a hadith in Bukhari that says, as he's eat the food, the food would glory, glorify Allah. Guys, understand that. He's having, let's say, a steak sandwich. And the steak sandwich say, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. The Messenger is about to eat me. SubhanAllah. Mm, tasty. Anyway, with that said, narrated Abdullah ibn Amr. Allah's Messenger said, fasting in the Quran intercede for a man. Fasting says, O my Lord, I have kept him away from his food and his passions by day. So accept my intercession for him. The Quran says, I have kept him away from sleep by night. So accept my intercession for him. Then their intercession is accepted. That Muhammad didn't simply believe this metaphorically. He believed they actually are conscious. This one is a narration where we find... 
the Quran appearing as a man. Not just any man, but a pale man, a white man. All right? Let me read the narration. This comes from <clears throat> Sunan Ibn Majah. Sunan Ibn Majah, and it's also found in other narrations, but Sunan Ibn Majah, it was narrated from Ibn Buraida that his father told that the Messenger of Allah said, the Quran will come on the day of the resurrection like a pale man. And we'll say, so he appear, Quran appears in human form. Folks, Muslims tell me Allah will not appear as a man or become a man, yet the Spirit of Allah appears as a perfect man. The Quran appears as a pale man, right? And when he appears as a pale man, it will say, I am the one that kept you awake at night and made you thirsty during the day. So when the Muslim comes out of his grave, he'll have someone waiting for him. Hi, who are you? You don't recognize me? I'm the Quran, buddy. I'm the Quran that you recite. Yeah, I had to take the form of a pale man so that you would be comfortable speaking to someone else that looked like you. Though I'm pale, you may be olive skin. But the fact is, I'm the Quran here. And don't be afraid. I'm going to take you before Allah and everything will be good. I'll take care of you. Don't be afraid, Allah, because I'm to see from. Now, with that said, let me read how the Quran worships Allah. The Quran worships Allah. Mishkat al-Masabi. This will be all in the, the link. Mishkat al-Masabi. Khalid bin Madan said, recite the rescuer. Notice the Quran is the savior. Rescuer means the one who saves you. Recite this rescuer, the one that saves you, which is Alif Lam Mim. The sending down. So he's now saying, recite chapter 32 of the Quran. Recite chapter 32 of the Quran. Okay? For I have heard that a man who had committed many sins used to recite it and nothing else. It spread its wings over him. So this chapter will appear as a bird as well. again, right? Chapter 2 and 3 appears of flocks of bird. Chapter here, 32 appears as a bird as well. Spread its wings over him. Now watch this, folks. And said, my Lord. Forgive him, for he often used to recite me. So chapter 32 of the Quran, like chapters 2 and 3, will appear as a bird, spread the wings to protect the man. So the wings will be on the man. Imagine he's the one. My Lord, please, please uh, forgive him. Don't punish him. So the Quran is going to talk to Allah and calls Allah, my Lord. The Quran is worshipping Allah. My Lord, Rabbi. Oh, but it gets better because it says now the Quran argues with Allah. It argues with Allah. I'm not making it up. So the Lord Most High made it an intercessor from him and said, Record from a good deed and raise him a degree in place of every sin. Khalid said, It will dispute on behalf of the one who recites it when he is in the grave saying, O oh God, if I am a part of thy book, make me an intercessor for him. But if I am not part of thy book, blot me out of it. Sounds like what Moses did, right? I'll get back to that in a minute. It will be like a bird putting its wing on him. It will intercede for him. And will protect him from the punishment in the grave. Wow. Let's break this down real quickly. Chapter 32 of the Quran will appear as a bird with wings. It talks to Allah and says to Allah, You are my Lord, O God, Ya Allah, Allahumma, Rabbi, my Lord. Please don't punish him. Please forgive him. And if I'm part of your book, you got to forgive him. If not, blot me out. Folks, that's what Moses said to Yahweh. If you go to Exodus 32, 32 to 33, I'm giving the reference. Exodus 32, 32 to 33, Moses says to Yahweh, forgive them, do not blot them out of your book. But if not, then blot me out of your book. If you're not going to forgive Israel for their sins, blot me out of your book. And God says, I will blot out the name of him who sins against me. The Quran says the same thing. It says, if I'm part of your book, you, you better forgive him, Allah. So he's arguing, Allah, you got to forgive him. If, you're, if you don't, I don't want to be part of your book. Blot me out. So Allah says, all right, okay, you're part of the book and you're eternal, so I can't blot you out without also blotting out a part of me. You know what? You win. You know, I cry, uncle. <laughs> Forgive him. <laughs> but wait, wait. The Quran is supposed to be a part of Allah. Yet the Quran, it's individual chapters. Individual chapters can separate from each other. Individual app chapters can appear in, human, in not human form, in a visible form, as birds. The Quran itself appears as a pale man. Now, let's do the math, David. If individual chapters of the Quran are conscious and can separate from each other and appear separately in different visible forms, and the Quran is 114 chapters, the one we have today. The one we use now. So if we go with Ubay bin Kab, it's 116. Mm -hmm. That means there are 100... Guys, let it sink in. And then I'm going to have him... Hammer it. And, 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 and that's assuming that the ones like that Abu Musa referred to that were lost, that you know, because yeah, they'll all be there. Then we got 118, right? Okay, so let's go with 
Let's go at 114. Let's we'll stick with 114. Okay. Guys, understand the implication. There are 114 persons in the Quran. Each chapter has its own individual consciousness, which is why they can appear separately in visible forms. Each chapter, because it's personal, that means the Quran consists of 114 persons. The Quran addresses Allah as Allah and as its Lord. So the Quran is subservient to Allah, worships Allah as its Lord, and the Quran is 114 persons, but the Quran is inseparable from Allah. Let's do the math. Allah, His Spirit, 114 persons of the Quran. By golly, that sounds like Allah is composed of 116 persons, Dave. Mm -hmm. Help me understand that. Um, yeah, but the, I mean, the, those 114, they sort of combine into uh, uh, another one. You know what I mean? It's like, like Voltron, right? They come uh -huh. together. Like Devastator, right? They, they, uh, but it's it's 114 that come together, but then give rise to another consciousness because it does appear as a pale man, right? Right? Pale man. So but, collectively, but, can but, remember, a... but remember, Sam, Christians believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, and that, that just doesn't make sense, right? Absolutely. You need to stick with the 114 persons of the Quran in addition to uh, the, spirit. the Spirit and Allah. That's what makes real sense. Now, now, now think about this, Sam, because... Here's here's something that we notice, but then no matter how many times we tell Muslims, they don't notice unless they notice it right before they leave Islam, right? Muhammad is absorbing and stealing teachings from all around him. And this was an accusation that's that's found over and over again in the Quran. We know this. We know that this is what everyone's saying this. This guy's just copying everything he hears, right? Muhammad is copying things from the Christians. He's copying things from the Jews. He's copying things from the pagans. And he, he puts all of this stuff to, together into one big ball and just calls it Tawheed, right? Think about think about what's going on here, right? What's the, what's the, the Trinity in the Quran that Sam has pointed out? You've got Allah and you've got his word, which is co-eternal with him and its own conscious agent that is distinct from Allah, mm -hmm. and yet it's also divine. And you've got Allah's spirit, which is uncreated, proceeds from within Allah, and yet is sent by Allah and is distinct from him. Why do you find this in the Muslim sources? Well, the best explanation I've seen, unless Muslims want to say that Islam just teaches the Trinity, the best explanation I can think of is that Muhammad's copying so much stuff from the Jews and Christians and yet he keeps forgetting to think about the implications of what he's of what he's of what he's teaching, That's right? An illiterate ignoramus. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Muhammad is trying to come up with replacements for the pagan teachings. The pagans believe that these goddesses would intercede for you with Allah. You have these bird, these inter these intercessory birds. They intercede with Allah. What does Muhammad say? Yes, those chat those are chapters of the Quran. The chapters of the Quran are the are entire flocks of birds. There are these flocks of birds that intercede with you. So Muhammad takes all of these pagan teachings, combines them with all these things he's hearing from Jews and Christians, puts them all together, and calls it the unification. What is this? Exactly. What is it unifying? Beautiful. It's unifying yeah. all the teachings of everyone, putting them together in one big ball and calling it pure monotheism. Do you understand, guys? How do you not see how stupid and ridiculous this is? I mean, no. I mean, a five-year-old could see this and they don't get it. We're talking about the spiritual blindness here. No, it's, it's a miracle. miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. But I want to add even more to the problem. There's more? Yeah, because here now we're going to deal with the dual natures of Christ, the incarnation. Okay, guys, understand Muslim theology. The Quran is not... Wait, 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 wait. Just, just, but before but oh, before before actually. you move on, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. say a, a lot, a loose and a knot. They're these. They're, yeah, e the goddess, e each yeah. each one is a bird, right? Yeah. But the chapters of the Quran, the chapters of the Quran are, are entire flocks of birds, right? Yeah. So Surah two is a Surah two is an entire flock. And chapter three is a flock. The, the the implication is that the individual birds. The individual birds would be individual verses, right? That's the that's the unstated implication. That's right? would be the implication of yeah. implication, right? The idea is, guys, now you have way more so birds. Over six thousand. Now you have over six thousand, not just those little entities. three. Welcome to Islam. You don't just get three; you get six. You get over six thousand of these birds, over, yeah, right? So yeah, well, that's it's so so no, this so, is the miracle so anyway. Of so anyway, anyway what's wrong with I just guy. I just yeah, wanted I just wanted to, I just wanted to point out, right? You're getting me upset. You've got the one Quran which appears as a pale man. 
then each chapter of the Quran appears as a flock of birds. So the Quran itself is multipersonal because within the one personality of the Quran who shows up to intercede for you, there are 114 flocks of birds that also show up for you and they each have their own personality, but the implication is they're flocks of birds. So they're the individual each. birds. So each one of the chapters of the Quran is also is also multi-personal. It's multi-personal upon multi-personal. But remember, Sam, the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't make sense and it's illogical Listen, because David, it's multi-personal. You upset me and you know what? ISIS should hunt you down and kill you because you don't <laughs> appreciate the miracle of Allah. The message. miracle of the unification. You dirty kafir. He can I'm take anything. I'm getting upset. He can take anything. You guys got a teaching? Bring no, it in here. I'll fit it into my religion. You guys no, no, got no. a pagan stone? Bring it over here. I'll fit that you into my religion. You are upsetting me, you white everything. cover. You Persians believe in these hoardies and, and Muhammad these was eternal black. sex slaves? Bring them on. I'll put them in my religion. Listen, Muhammad was black. I can fit black. everything into you my are religion, dirty ladies white and gentlemen. I'm there about is no to limit. bust your head. There is no limit to what I can bring into my unification. Here, I'm about to bust Tawheed. his head. Listen. Tawheed. Calm yourself down. I'm about to bash your head for the sake of the Muslims here. Real quickly. Real quickly here. Dale Lee, this is why I say this guy, Dale Lee, is a joke. He doesn't listen to anything. He only parrots. He just said it's figurative. Guys, did you did you hear my response to that? How can it be figurative when Muhammad himself describes the Quran appearing as a pale man? What is figurative about that? Muhammad is saying that the Quran will appear in visible form so that the person can see the Quran in visible form and speak to the Quran in its visible form. I mean, anyway, I don't want to waste my time on it because now it's going to get Ooh. worse. Hold on, it's going to get worse. I, I have to, no, we're going forward. No, no, no. I have to say it because otherwise I'll forget it. We can have in an upcoming episode of Muhammad's oh, Boom Boom Room, Muhammad meets the Quran. Oh, yeah. It'll yeah, be yeah, the yeah, super yeah, yeah. pale no, dude. you got to do flocks of birds as well. Yeah, okay. That's going to be kind of yeah, tricky. Yeah. you got to do it. Yeah, well, oh, I could just get a bunch of flake bir no, you uh, do fake that. birds and they could the be all... Quran. No, you got to do that. Because it's funny because, guys, the, 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 the ongoing problem is... Think about this. There could be a if there were a thousand Muslims watching this right now, no, not one of them has heard of this stuff because their leaders hide what their prophet actually yeah, said yeah. from them, right? Their leaders conceal their prophet's actual words and teachings because they want them to have this false confidence and this pure monotheism that Islam doesn't teach, that Muhammad never taught, right? What Muhammad actually taught is I'm gonna bring everything together and it's all gonna form again like Voltron or Devastator into one big monotheism. So that's what Muhammad actually taught. But yeah, in order to educate them, we're going to have Muhammad meets a flock right of it. birds and Muhammad meets a pale And Quran. when you do that, if I, right when I start this, if you cut me off again, I'm going to bust your head. I'm going to pretend that I'm a Muslim and I'm going to enact Allah's wrath upon you. Okay, go ahead. We're going to have to do this point. You got to get this point, Christians, because it deals with the incarnation and Jesus dying. He's used it in the debate, but we're going to bring it up. I swear to you, you remember these arguments, Christians and Muslims are going to go crying to the Blackstone until they repent and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, understand. Okay, go ahead and teach. Now, watch. Get the argument here. Man, I hope you get this argument. I, I really hope you do. Because this is going to be such a nightmare for Islam. I'm not lying. The Quran. Oh, I got an idea. If, if, you if, cut me off I... again. <laughs> well, if you threaten me, you know I'm going to do okay, it. Okay, but I'm going to bust you up. Right, okay, ahead. the Quran is not other than Allah. It's inseparable from him. Whether you like it or not, Muslims, if the Quran is inseparable from Allah and the Quran becomes a book, a part of Allah becomes a book. You can't, because you can't separate the Quran from Allah. If the Quran becomes a book, a part of him has become a book and physical. But here's what it, where it gets beautiful. You see all this mess that David brought up? Each individual verse is a bird. So you have over 6,000 6, birds in the Quran. But folks, guess, well, guess what? You have... Maybe millions of copies of the Arabic Quran. That is also the Quran. So now you have, let's say, 10 million copies. 10 million Arabic Qurans running around. They're all Qurans. But they'll tell you it's still the same. Though it's 10 million Arabic Qurans, it's still one Quran. 10 million Arabic Qurans, multiply that by over 6,000 verses... Man, you got hundreds of millions of little divine Allahs running around the planet Earth. But hold on, wait. Now, what happens if I take the Quran like Uthman did and I burn it? Does that mean I destroy the Quran? Well, if I destroy the Quran, then I destroy a part of Allah. But what will the Muslims say? No, 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 no. You destroyed the physical part, but the essence, the real Quran, remains indestructible. 
Well, then, Muslims, why do you complain when we say Jesus died as a man, but as God, he's still alive, he's still conscious, so that physically you can destroy his body, but that person is indestructible, he's alive. If you believe that about the Quran, that you can destroy the physical part without destroying the essence of the Quran, then you just destroyed your main objection against Jesus being God who died, because the God-man died, but in his physical body, but that person was still alive and conscious and cannot be destroyed. Any more than you believe that when Uthman burned the Qurans, all those Qurans, he destroyed the Quran and therefore destroyed a part of Allah, which is inseparable from him. David, what do you got to say? I, I, I got to say, but Sam, uh, if Jesus is God, how, how, can, how can Jesus die? Oh, yeah, you got me there, man. <laughs> I'm done. I, I give up. Refuted. I'm, I'm done. Refuted. Literally, actually, I'm done with the argument. So if you want to go Q&A, whatever. Okay. I mean, okay. Because, hey, you guys got all the arguments. It doesn't take long to understand. We, we, you got the links. Please use these arguments. In your witness, use social media, everywhere, the Muslims will be crying. Look, guys, when, when it comes down to things like evidence and so on, um, Muslim apologists have their standard go-to. Oh, but, you know, Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible and, and uh, there are scientific miracles in the Quran. Those only work in an atmosphere of ignorance. As yep. soon as they're talking to someone who has any clue what he's talking about, they have to abandon those because, I mean, come on, the, the, the arguments are ridiculous. So what you have is Islamic apologists are ultimately going to retreat into the confidence of their, their pure monotheism. Like, like even, a, even a, what was it, a week or so ago when we asked Muslims, um, hey, give us your, your best arguments for Islam. A bunch of them said, oh, because Muhammad taught Tawheed. That was bye that was bye that bye was argument. that was an argument, right? He taught how he 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 taught this oneness. That, that that means that that means that he's a prophet. Uh, silly, 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 silly position. But notice they're 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 retreating to this position of but but you know our theology is not confusing and that makes it true. Why do they say that? Because they have no clue what's in their sources. Yeah. They have no clue what's in their sources. As soon as you start unpacking what's in their sources, you destroy even that claim. And what is there left, Muhammad? Yeah. Muhammad? I want to invite the Christians here. This is why I say, guys, ignore Dale Lee because he only embarrasses Muhammad. Dale Lee, I'm going to respond to this for the benefit of Christians. Dale Lee, a Muslim? Yeah. He's the guy that comes in your comment section and posts like 10,000 words from copy and paste articles. He's a joke. But guys, listen to what he said. He said, God is not in this world, therefore God can't die. Okay, now guys, tell me if you understand my reasoning. Tell me, yes, Sam, we got it. Muslim theology, Dale Lee, the clown, said, believes the Quran is the speech of Allah, the word of Allah, therefore it's a part of him. Since it's a part of Allah and the Quran is in the world, and you can't separate the Quran from Allah, that means a part of Allah is in the world. So according to Daly's logic, since now a part of Allah is in the world, that means a part of Allah can die. Did you guys understand my logic? Let me repeat it again. I want to make sure the Christians got it, because I'm not going to waste my time on him. He said, God is not in the world, therefore he can't die. Wait, the Quran is inseparable from Allah. They say you cannot separate Allah's speech from Allah. The Quran is Allah's speech, can't be separated from him. The Quran is in the world, and the Quran can be burned. The Quran can be destroyed. It can be ripped to shreds. So according to his logic, since the Quran is a part of Allah, the Quran is in the world, a part of Allah is in the world, therefore a part of Allah can be destroyed, can die. Did you guys get it? The logic? Thank you, Dale Lee. Anyway, they got it. <clears throat> no. Any questions, guys, or we can keep going? Check this out. Abdul Rahman. So what should we Muslims do? Do as the Christians have done to their religion? No, you should do what Muslims do. Ignore everything and have your scholars conceal all this from you, keep you in a state of complete ignorance about what your, your prophet taught and sh stroke your hair at night and say, don't worry, just trust us. Ignore everything your prophet and your God said and just trust us to say it's pure monotheism and makes pure sense. That's what you should do because that's what you've been doing for 14 centuries. That's right. Is that correct? Exactly, yeah, yeah. That's right. Guys, like I said, remember these arguments, use these arguments, glorify Christ with these arguments so that Muslims see the gig is up. Your religion is not monotheistic. It's jig. Okay. I, I've, I've heard never, I've heard never, never condemn someone for pronouncing a word wrong because it means they learned it from reading, right? Yes, yeah. and so you read a lot. You got these words. Yeah. Jig. I don't like to say I, that. I, 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 huh? I, like, it's, you know, it's just, I don't like this. It has just such negative connotations for me. But anyway, then, don't, then don't use all the right. word at all. Jiggernaut is up. Anyway, 
What's the point? It's over. Islam is not monotheistic. Islam is not a miracle. It contains gross... It's the unification. ...scientific blunders, historical inaccuracies, immoral teaching. Horrible. Uh, Muhammad was a, a, a robber, a woman raping, bandit, you name it. It's over. Islam's days are numbered by the grace of Jesus Christ. If you guys just learn this, uh, these arguments and apply them for the glory of Christ. Now... Is there any other questions on, on this? Or? There's a bunch. Okay, go ahead. Let's, no, let's no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go no, ahead I mean, basically, about... just to sum up again, Allah, His Spirit, and the Quran. These three, according to the Quran and Islamic sources, are eternal, uncreated, and truly, fully divine. There is a subordination. Because, guys, don't forget that narration I read. The Quran will address, chapter 32 of the Quran will address Allah saying, Rabbi, my Lord, my Lord. So there you have the Quran, subordinate to Allah, subject to Allah, worshiping Allah as its Lord. You know why that's a, that's a, interesting? Because Muslims object to Jesus being God because he worshiped the Father as his God when he became man. So Jesus, as the perfect man who's not the Father, worships the Father and calls him my God, and that's taken as an objection against Jesus being one with the Father in essence. Well, how can the Quran be eternal, uncreated, inseparable from Allah when it worships Allah as its Lord? You see, Muslims, what Jesus has done to your religion? The same measure you've been using against us, the Lord has now given that measure into our laps to use against you to prove Muhammad is a fraud and antichrist and agent of Satan. And a joke. Glory to Jesus Christ. Check out Oswaldo here. Yes. David is kind of crazy. True. Not that I don't agree with him. I just don't see any love in him. Where is the love? Where's the love? You've All he does is God. dedicate his entire life to reaching people who call for his death and threaten his wife and kids with death and threaten to rape his wife and mother. And he still sits here night after night trying to reach them, responding to the same objections over and over and over again. Where's the love? Where's the love, man? David, I don't make sense. Abdurrahman says, we don't worship the Quran, Sam. You don't <laughs> make sense. You don't worship, we don't worship the Quran, David. We, you don't make sense. <laughs> let, let, let's take one from, from uh, someone else now. Rational Youth said, uh, Act 17 Apologetics and Shamunian. Yes. Do you know about Ubaid Allah, yeah, Ibn, Allah. Jash, Ibn Jash, the brother of Zainab, who was the first major apostate and became Christian? Yes. Is it authentic? Yes. Well, you, it comes from the oldest sources of Islam, like Ibn Ishaq. So. He was one of the, they're called the four uh, Hanifs. Yeah, yes. yeah. And uh, when he has. He converted when he went to Abyssinia. Abyssinia yeah. And he says, we see clearly, but you guys are blinking. Became a Christian. Yep. Became a Christian. So, 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 Muhammad. so this, is, this, is, this is the brother of, who's this the brother of? Hmm. The woman... That was We've already been discussing this. To Muhammad's son. Oh, but it's not his son. It's his adopted son. And he did it as a mercy for other adopted fathers. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. And Lord willing, we're going to revisit that tomorrow. Yeah. CP's going beyond. Yeah. So remember Zainab, the wife of Muhammad's adopted son uh, that Muhammad wanted because he saw her practically naked and then decided that he had to have her and that Allah was giving her to him and broke up the marriage because he was lusting after her and then married her. Yeah. Her brother, her brother. Uh, was an early convert to Islam. And then when Muslims were, were being persecuted, he, he went to Abyssinia, where they were they were uh, protected by Christians, where they were protected by Christians. And while he was there, he recognized that Islam is false and ridiculous, became a Christian. Okay, now, if we have a few more minutes, I'm going to introduce another nightmare for One second, moment. one second, one okay. second. I just want... I'm going to introduce it we, before we, 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 we want We want people to see the reaction here. So what, Sam? So what? It's a good deal. I mean, think about, guys, think about this. Muslims claim, but our theology is so simple. Unlike you Christians, one plus one plus one equals one. Ha ha, that's so oh. silly, ridiculous. Why don't you come over to Islam where one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, 114 ones all adds up to one. <laughs> it's the multi-personal Quran. See, that makes perfect sense. Unlike your one plus one plus one equals one that's so dumb I'd and we've got have... we've got our allah our allah who is co-eternal with his eternal spirit 
who appears as a physical as a physical man. being in the appearance as a man who is a conscious agent who is distinct from Allah and yet is sent by Allah and yet has Allah's uh, attributes and it and do, is a conscious agent and the the conscious eternal Quran which is also distinct from Allah and has Allah's attributes and the Quran itself is multi-personal having 114 separate distinct personalities who are intercessors for you and what does he say in response to all this so what i'd who rather cares? have i'd rather have over 6000 divine persons david because that increases the likelihood i'll enter jannah yeah would you, you rather have only three yeah, or over 6000 my odds are it looks pretty good that i'll make it to jannah in spite of allah's deception what's wrong with you Wow. But Dale Lee's Welcome got the ultimate refutation. Islam. Dale Lee's got the ultimate ref refutation. Hang on, let, let's just finish the comment. Uh, but did, uh, you got, I got to share it. It's only Dale one Lee, second. Dale, Dale, Dale Lee, you know what? what? You know what's the ultimate? King David committed adultery with Bathsheba, David. That's it. What's that I, got to do with anything? No, he just destroyed your don't, entire don't, presentation. Don't, don't we grant that? No, but he destroyed your entire argument. Doesn't the Bible condemn him for that? But he just Do, do Christians man. believe that, that prophets and kings are, are sinless? But David, he just destroyed your argument. It's over. Notice, Back up. guys, do you see it? Yeah. From one, it's so what? And the other, it's let me completely change the subject here. Yeah. <laughs> what is this religion, man? What is this? My goodness. Anyway, now, if there's no question, I want to do chapter one. We got to do it. We got to end it with a bang. We got to end it with a bang. How Lord are you going to end it with a bang, man? Okay, but before you do that, guys, Lord willing, I'm going to be with David till Monday, and I got to leave, but pray we come back again. And we do these regularly. So Monday, God willing, will be my final show for a little bit until I reunite with this brother. So keep praying. And after that, I will fortunately, fortunately be doing some live streams with other people. Okay, yeah, that'll be even better. Surah 1, I got to do this. Guys, please, uh, Christians, let, make sure in the comments you let me know you're following the logic. Here's another one that pretty much is going to send Islam packing. Chapter 1 of the Quran, remember, chapter 1 is uncreated, it's eternal. Chapter 1, Surah Al-Fatiha. Uncreated, eternal. It's always existed. Okay? You guys get that? Say yes or put a one. Chapter 1 of the Quran is part of the Quran. Therefore, it's uncreated. It's always existed. If you get that, let me read it. Let me read it because here's the problem. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Pay attention. This is an uncreated, eternal prayer. All the praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds or all beings. Rabbul Alameen. Okay? The Lord of all the worlds. The most beneficent, the most merciful. Guys, pay attention. Okay. The only owner of the day of recompense, the day of resurrection, resurrection Malik Yomadin. You alone we worship. You alone we worship. And you alone we ask for help. Guide us. Guide us to the straight path. The way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace. Not the way of those who earned your anger, nor of those who went astray. Now, guys, you understand what I just read, according to Islamic theology, is an eternal, uncreated prayer, right? I just want to say, you got it? Put it, put it, yes? Okay, if you get it, guys, here's the problem. If it's an uncreated, eternal prayer, who was praying it before creation? Who was praying chapter 1 before creation? Who was saying, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help, guide us to the straight path, the way on the, those on whom you have bestowed your grace, people didn't even exist at that time. What is this prayer talking about? People you bestowed your grace on? Of those who did not earn your anger. You, wait, there are no creatures. What is this all about? Whoever is praying, this is omniscient. Why? Because the one who's praying or the, the group who's praying are fully aware that in the future, there'll be those who have the mercy of Allah upon them, their grace, but those who earn his wrath and go astray. So the prayer is being prayed by someone or more than someone who knows the future. So my question is, who could be praying this eternal, uncreated prayer in eternity before create creatures? And whoever it is clearly knows the future because he or they are aware in the future there will be people whom Allah will be angry with and will go astray. Who could be praying this prayer in eternity, folks? Either it's the Quran praying to Allah, which again, the Quran worships Allah, and the Quran is asking Allah to guide it on the straight path because the Quran is afraid it may go astray. But how could the Quran be afraid to go astray if it's inseparable from Allah? Or Allah's praying it. Allah's praying the prayer. But then who is Allah 
praying it to, who is Allah saying, you alone we worship, you alone we seek help, and who is Allah asking to guide him on the straight path so he doesn't go astray? So either the Quran is praying it, and the Quran is worshiping Allah, and is afraid of going astray, which means a part of Allah can go astray and sin, so there's an aspect of Allah that can sin against Allah, bringing Allah's wrath, or Allah's praying it, which means Allah, is afraid that he can sin and go astray and need someone greater than him to guide him. Folks, let me now put the icing on the cake. Let me read this part again. Guide us to the straight path, chapter 1, verse 6. Guide us on the straight path. Are you aware that according to the Quran, Allah is on a straight path? Let me read that again. Guide us on the straight path. Did you know, according to chapter 11, verse 56 of the Quran, Allah himself is on a straight path. In other words, Allah is not the straight path. And the straight path doesn't bring you to Allah. Allah is on the straight path with Muslims. Where am I getting this from? Chapter 11, verse 56. Chapter 11, verse 56. I put my trust in Allah, my Lord and your Lord. There is not a moving living creature, but he has grasp of its forelock. Verily, my Lord is on the straight path. Verily, my Lord is on the straight path. Whoa. Allah is on a straight path. The one praying, chapter 1 says, guide me on the straight path. Since no one existed in eternity besides Allah, and since Allah is on the straight path, that means Allah must be the one praying, saying, guide me on the straight path, but then how can He be the only one in eternity? That means there's someone mightier than Him, a greater God than Him that He's praying to. Or Allah's schizophrenic, He's basically saying to Himself, you who happens to be me, I worship. You who happens to me, right, I look for strength. You who happens to be me, guide me on a straight path. And you who happens to be me, don't let me stray. This is the wonderful religion of Islam. That's what we got. <clears throat> there you go. Dale Lee's still going, your buddy here. Check this out. What is it? King Check David it. saw her bathing and slept with her. Muhammad didn't even go inside her house. Really? So he admits, though. He admits the story, though. Yeah, I mean, he has to. I mean, it's. I mean, it's in the Quran. My goodness. Um, but 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 think about this, right? We believe, don't we, Sam, that prophets can sin horribly, and God is going to punish them for that, right? Hundred percent. He got David himself as an example. The Lord severely disciplined him. The child died. Mm -hmm. His his son revolted and that against was like him. That, that was like I mean his life was a disaster after From that, that right day on. Sons rebelled. I mean, son rebelled against him. I mean, the, the kingdom was divided, horrible war, all because all because all because he sinned. Is that the same thing that happens in Islam, where Muhammad sins and Aisha goes, "Wow, your Lord hastens to satisfy your desires," and all Allah does is justify it. And who cares about everyone else? Think about the reaction, right? Muhammad sees a beautiful girl and says, hmm, wow, she's really hot. I believe God must be giving her to me. And then what's Allah's response? Yes, Muhammad, you have to do it. You have to take her. You have to do it. As a matter of fact, I'm putting it in my eternal Quran that you have to have this woman and it's good and you have to do it. The only thing that would be bad is if you don't do what I say in having sex with all these people I'm telling you to have sex with, right? Do you, do you guys see the difference? A prophet in the Bible sins, God condemns and judges him. In the in, in Islam, Muhammad sins in horrible, horrible ways. And all, all God does is run up there and go, yeah, I want you to have all this. I want you to do it even more. In fact, if you don't do all of these horrible things, I'm going to judge you and condemn you. Welcome to Islam, man. Yep. Na Naeem, Naeem is, is, is still here. We How many times we got to tell you? We're, we're, we're talking about, this is the subject for tomorrow, but it's good we're getting the objections here now. Okay, the same thing he always oh, says. The lust story is a fabrication. False. Muhammad told Zainab to marry Zayd, persuaded her. Sorry, he didn't break up their marriage. She mistreated Zayd, so Zayd wanted a divorce. Now, now, notice this. She mistreated Zayd. That's why Zayd wanted the divorce. Not because Zayd, yeah. not because Zayd realized, found out that Muhammad uh, lusted after her. Yeah. Is that is that correct, Sam? Now let, let me let me show. You. Let's go with what you just said. So she mistreated Zayed. Zayed divorced her. But guess what, Naim? And I hope you're listening. Let me read the verses in the Quran that shows you what you just did. You actually introduced even more problems to the story. Why? Chapter thirty-three, verse thirty-six. Let's start with that. Naim, pay attention. I'm answering this for you, and you're going to go more in depth tomorrow. 
because I basically covered the topic. So I do want to address this. 33, 36. It is not for a believer, man or woman, and I'll explain why the woman is mentioned, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter that they should have any option in their decision. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, he has indeed straight and a plain error. So understand what you read. When Allah and his messenger, showing Muhammad is Allah's equal, because it's not just what Allah has decreed, what Allah and his messenger have decreed, a man and woman have no choice in the matter. Go read your commentaries, Naim. This was revealed in the context of Zainab refusing to marry Zayyid. Muhammad said, I want you to marry Zayyid. She didn't want to. This verse came down, then she had no choice. You don't have a say in the matter. Allah and me have decided you're going to marry Zayyid. Now, how does this introduce problems for you? If she was mocking Zayyid, then all Muhammad had to do was stop mocking him. This is a decree from Allah and his messenger. If you keep mocking and hurting his feelings, expect a, per a terrible, painful chastisement from Allah. But it gets worse. Because in chapter 33, verse 37, let me read this. And remember when you said to, to him, on whom Allah bestowed his grace, and you have done favor, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. Now notice what you just said, Nahum. You said, Zayd divorced Zainab. But the verse says, Muhammad ordered him, keep your wife, according to 33, 36, David. Wasn't Zayd supposed to obey Muhammad? Because it says, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when it's decreed, you have no say-so. So he just said to him, keep your wife. So if he's a good Muslim, okay. Mm -hmm. And Zainab, you were wedded to, to Zayd by orders of Allah. How dare you mock him? You're going to go to hell. Shut your mouth, right? He could have mm -hmm. done that, right? Yep. And then Zayd had the authority to beat her, right? Because if he feared rebellion on her part, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what do we end up with? You now have Zayd going against Allah and his messenger. Zaynab going against Allah and his messenger. So that means they defied the decree of Allah and his messenger. So they are hypocrites, sinners, who are now under the wrath of Allah and his messenger. Is he sure you want to go that route? Uh, let me go ahead and read a passage here. Maybe we'll bring this passage up on the screen tomorrow uh, because it completely contradicts everything Naeem is saying. Mm -hmm. This is the History of At-Tabari, Volume 8, Page 2. All right, let's read the story. And so we'll see how well it lines up with what Naeem is saying. Now notice what Naeem is saying completely contradicts the Quran. What do we, what do we have from Islam's historians? The messenger of God came to the house of Zayd bin Haritha. Zayd was always called Zayd bin Muhammad. Not for long, not for long, because Muhammad needs to justify this marriage, and so adoption's about to go bye-bye. Perhaps the messenger of God missed him at that moment so as to ask, where is Zayd? He came to his residence to look for him, but did not find him. Zayna bin Jahash, Zayd's wife, rose to meet him. Because she was dressed only in a shift, that's a lady's undergarment, because she was dressed only in a shift, the messenger of God turned away from her. She said, he is not here, messenger of God. Come in, you who are as dear to me as my father and mother. The messenger of God refused to enter. Zainab had dressed in haste when, had, uh, uh, Zainab had dressed in haste when she was told the messenger of God is at the door. She jumped up and in haste, and excited the admiration of the messenger of God so that he turned away murmuring something that could scarcely be understood. However, he did say overtly, glory be to God. Glory be to God the Almighty. Glory be to God who causes hearts to turn. So notice, she's wearing only a, an undergarment. She jumps up in haste. Muhammad sees her and he turns away. But then he starts praising Allah. Praise Allah, praise Allah who causes hearts to turn. What's he talking about, Sam? I got a little more to read here, but no, what's he talking about? The he hearts means, to turn. Praise be to Allah that he married her to my son-in-law, Zayyid, a match made in heaven. Allah, how merciful are you to my son, Zayyid? In other words, he's saying, praise be to Allah who caused me to desire this married woman. Mm -hmm. He yep. put in my heart lustful desires for a married woman. He's, and the Quran says mm -hmm. it too, by the way. Yep. Just confirm the Quran. So we'll read there that part when you're done. When Zayed came home, his wife told him that the messenger of God had come to his house. Zayed said, why didn't you ask him to come in? She replied, I asked him, but he refused. 
Did you hear him say anything? He asked. She replied, as he turned away, I heard him say, glory be to God, the almighty glory be to God who causes hearts to turn. Remember, this is after he sees her and her little nighty and turns away and starts praising Allah. He starts praising Allah for what he's seen and, and realized. So Zayed left and having come to the messenger of Allah, he said, messenger of God, I have heard that you came to my house. Why didn't you go in, you who are as dear to me as my father and mother? Messenger of God, perhaps Zainab has excited your admiration. It's already said that, it, that she excited his admiration. What's that mean? That means he lusted he was for a married yeah. woman. Lust, emphasize it. Adulterous, lustful desires. Perhaps Zainab has excited your admiration, and so I will separate myself from her. Wow. Notice, what, notice what name says. He didn't break up their marriage. She mistreated Zainab. So, Z so Zayd wanted a divorce. What's he say right here? What, what, what does Zayd actually say? Muhammad, I heard that you're lusting after my wife, so I'll divorce her. Why is he going to divorce her? Wow. Why is he going to divorce her? Because he realized that Muhammad was lusting after her. That's what your sources say. <laughs> I don't know. How, how long can we keep this up, man? How long can we yeah, keep it up? What it Muslims is, believe one thing. They do not understand what their prophet is yeah. actually like. We quote their sources to them. They reject their own sources. They don't even care what's in the Quran. They only care about their own feelings and their own justifications for Muhammad. What, no, Muhammad couldn't have done that. Here, here's, here's the story, Sam. Yes, Muhammad just wanted his son to have a happy marriage. But his son was being horribly abused by this yeah, woman. And really? she's just, oh man, she's doing horrible things to him. And the marriage is just broken up. And loving Muhammad that he is, he steps in and marries this, this beautiful woman that he saw almost naked uh, a, a little earlier. And uh, abolishes adoption. Yeah, but you know, can't make, can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs there. You know what I mean? You know, you know what it is, David? Honestly, psychologically, what's happening, and I'm not a psychologist, but it's what's happening is it's a shock. These Muslims have been taught since their children islam is unassailable it's irrefutable there's no way if you're honest you can refute islam they're seeing their prophet exposed for the wicked immoral deviant antichrist he is they're seeing how absurd how silly irrational incoherent the quran is they're seeing that their god makes absolutely no sense their world is is caving in <clears throat> The very foundations of their religion is being destroyed by the grace of the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the reaction is shock and denial. So this is why they're reacting. to it's, it's, They can't believe it. There's no way. It's like, you know, it's like someone producing the body of Jesus Christ to me and showing me this is the body of Christ. I'll be in complete shock and denial. Jesus is dead. He didn't rise from the dead. It would traumatize me. This is what you're seeing because the Muslims have been living in a bubble where they've been taught the Quran is a miracle of miracles. Even unbelievers admit it. It can't be refuted. Muhammad is the greatest man who lived. It is destroying them internally. But glory to God. They need this shock and awe. Shock and awe. By the grace of Jesus, the Spirit will then open their hearts and bring them to... And by the way, true story. I'm going to give you a true story of Ali Sinna who runs faithfreedom.org. Ali Sinna. And he's now, he actually believes God exists and Jesus is God, by the way. Mm -hmm. He became an atheist. He, part of his story, you know what it was, folks? Ali Sinna? Pray. He now believes God is real. Jesus is God. He actually believes Jesus is God, but he still doesn't think the Bible is completely reliable. But he's a work in progress, right? So he's, the journey's not over for him. He said when he read the Quran in a translation in his mother tongue, and he read the, the Bhagavad Muhammad, he hit major depression. He was shocked. He could not believe what he read. Because of what he was taught, and then when he picked up the Quran and read it in his trans in his mother tongue, a translation in his mother tongue, and then read the Bhagavad Muhammad, he went into depression because he was shocked. He could not believe how evil, how immoral, how wicked Muhammad and his God happened to be. But then he came out of it. And now he believes God is real and Jesus is God. He went from a Muslim to an atheist to now. He knows God exists. There is an afterlife. Consciousness continues to exist apart from the body, and Jesus is God. He's he's getting there. All right, here's uh, in a different direction. All right. Janice says, I'm no scholar, and you can believe God is a trinity, an elephant, a snake, etc. But why is it that Orthodox Jews never worshipped a triune God, 
what were authentic Jews worshiping? Yeah. How many times do we have to deal with yeah, this? Yeah, but here's, when she says Orthodox Jews, at that time, they didn't call themselves Orthodox Jews. So I don't know. Are you talking about Orthodox Jews, medieval rabbinic Jews? Are you talking about modern Jews? Are you talking about Jews before the time of Christ? Are you talking about Jews during the time of Christ? What do you mean Orthodox Jews? Because, again, that term Orthodox Jews is a reference that we use today for what we call modern rabbinic Judaism. But even then, you have ultra-Orthodox, Hasidim, you have Orthodox, then you have Reform, you have Conservative. So what do you mean Orthodox Jews? Now, if you're asking me historically, is there evidence that before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and even after the time of Christ, there was a segment of Judaism that believed there was more than one divine person? Yes, they believe. In fact, we mentioned yesterday, I'm going to mention it again. If you don't want to get the book, it's by Alan F. Siegel. He wrote the book, Two Powers in Heaven, the standard reference work used by scholars. And he was a Jew, by the way. He's since deceased. He documents that even in the Talmud, you find the rabbis having problems with groups that were using Old Testament passages, one of which is covered by Anthony Rogers in his video, Genesis 1924. That comes up in the Talmud. And that passage was being used not just by Christians and Gnostics after the time of Christ. These were some of the passages being used by the Jews before the time of Christ and during the time of Christ to show there's more than one divine person. Now, they would call it powers. What they call powers, we call persons. You had Yahweh and another divine person subject to Yahweh. And then you have evidence that they were aware that the Spirit of God was God's presence that filled the earth. And then what's ironic, in the Talmud, you have the Spirit speaking to God, praying to God, showing that the rabbis who compiled the Talmud were aware that the Spirit was a distinct personality from God who could pray to God. And that same Talmud calls the Spirit the Shekhinah, the Shekinah, God's eminent presence in creation. So I don't know what you're talking about. What Jews, Jews before time Christ, were aware there were multiplicity of divine persons. I'll give you another reference. Philo the Jew, who was a contemporary of Christ. He was an Alexandrian Jew, writing in Greek, trying to explain the Jewish faith, Jewish faith to Greeks. And he mentioned in Greek the logos, logos. That's the Greek word for word. Also logic and reason comes from that word. He mentions the logos as a second God, not a creature, not uncreated in the sense that the logos comes out of God. So in that sense, it's not uncreated, but it's not part of creation. Called it the second God, called it the high priest, the chief of angels who sat on God's throne. Where did Philo get this? He didn't get it from John. John comes later. He didn't get it from Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus. He got it from the Old Testament, which speaks of the Word of God as a person sent by God who happens to be God. Maybe in a future session we can talk about that. Yeah, and uh, again, go ahead and watch the uh, videos in that series from Anthony Rogers. Anthony's been going through this. Oh, yeah. And Daniel Boyerin, by the way, he is an Orthodox Jew today. He's got a book proving that what Christians said about Jesus was a belief held by the Jews before Jesus, during Jesus. The only new element was they said that that second power, the Word, became human. That was the only new element that Christianity introduced, which shocked the Jews. So, Janice, what you have is that the, the doctrine of the Trinity would have been completely unshocking to Jews during the time of Jesus. But once you get to around 200 A.D., Jews started setting themselves against Christianity, right? Because they wanted to distinguish themselves from Christianity. So they retreated further further and further into Unitarianism. But uh, we're, we're not talking about later developments in, in Judaism. We're talking about what the, what the Bible teaches. And uh, Jews at the time of Jesus acknowledged, acknowledged that, that, that there is some sort of plurality within the one God. Uh, with that said, they didn't have the full revelation. Exactly. Christians did. Christians had the full revelation in Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, what on Aisha here? Okay. Joy Everett says, Hello, David and Sam. How do you deal with Muslims who say that Aisha wasn't uh, married to wasn't married to Muhammad while playing with dolls? Um, okay. I've, I've got I've got yeah, hadith. Go ahead, I've got the hadith right here. Right here. Oh, yeah. um, well, I, I would I would reply by quoting their sources to them. I would reply by quoting their sources to them. Sahih Muslim thirty three eleven. Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine. And her dolls were with her. And when he, the prophet, died, she was 18 years old. So I'd respond like that. She's taken to his house as a bride after he's been married to her two to three years. And her dolls were with her. Okay. If she had reached puberty by then, or if she was older, 
She wouldn't be. She certainly wouldn't be bringing dolls to Muhammad's house. Yep. She wouldn't be bringing dolls to Muhammad's house. She wouldn't be allowed to play with dolls. Those are images. They only allowed that for prepubescent girls, little kids, right? Yeah. So she's brought to Muhammad's house. And, and by the way, the only purpose of it, of including that detail is to show that she was prepubescent, right? And I'm going to quote the source yeah. for that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, this again. He read the narration. Aisha took her dolls to Muhammad's house when Muhammad slept with her when she was nine. Why was she allowed to have dolls? I want to read it. This comes from Sa'ad Bukhari, volume 8, number 151, and includes the commentary by Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, uh, Fat al-Bari, the premier commentary in Bukhari. It's all in our articles. Narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's apostle would, used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. Side note, what a sick human being. Not only is this young, this girl so young, she's playing with dolls. She's playing with a group of girls that are young with dolls. And he's there watching them play with dolls. And later on, he's going to go sleep with this young minor. Tell me this is not a sick man who deserves the hell that Jesus is going to send him to. But anyway, let's come back. The, now here's the commentary. This is the Muslim. The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden. But it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Not yet reached the age of puberty. That's why she was allowed to play with dolls. There you go. <clears throat> Do I need a follow up or is she, she's okay now? Are you all good? And notice uh, it wouldn't make a tremendous difference even if we even if we had no clue when Muhammad was doing this because it's still granted in the Quran that you can have sex with three girls, right? Yeah, yeah, 65 verse 4. I mean, guys, we didn't write chapter 65 verse 4. We're not the Muslim scholars who, to a T... All the medieval Muslim scholars, even modern Muslim scholars, will admit from Ibn Kathir, Al-Qurtubi, Tabari, Baidawi, Zamakshari, Jalalain, man, on and on and on. 65 verse 4 is talking about premature, prepubescent minors who haven't menstruated, who are married and having sex and being divorced so that someone else can come marry them. We didn't write 65 4. And it's not our exposition. It's the exposition of all the medieval Muslim scholars, even modern scholars like Maududi will admit this. What's Listen, if you're embarrassed by this, here's my advice. Give up on Islam. If these sources are embarrassing you and you're ashamed, that's a good sign you're in the wrong religion. Time to turn your back on Allah and His Messenger. Turn to Jesus, your only hope of salvation. Yeah, and, and by the way, no, notice, notice, notice the difference here, right? Um, Dale Lee. Ah, but... But, but King David lusted after a woman and committed adultery, we say. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's our, a our, sickle. Our, 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 book, our book records things like that, yeah, right? Yeah, but he we got you. try to hide those things. Isaac married Rebecca at 10. You see why I say this guy's a wicked liar and a clown? But I, th I thought it was three. Yeah, before it was, it was three. Other Muslims tell me three. You see why daily I say he's a joke and he just, he's an example yeah, of notice, what, what Islam does why to people would, why that are would, dishonest and wicked? Sam, do we have any reliable source on the age of Rebecca? There's not a single source that Zero. says Re Bible Rebecca say. was dead. No. In fact, if you read the context, she was mature She's enough clearly, that she yeah. can go by herself to the well, draw out water so she can take care of the flock of her father and have mature conversations and realize what marriage is all about. But let's take that to mean she was 10. Why? Why? What do you why? Do if she why? Had dolls? Now notice why would Dale Lee take that to mean? Oh, she's she's all she she must be ten because she's all grown up. <laughs> because this, of Aisha. this assumes that he thinks of nine and ten year olds yeah, as well, adults. That tells you he's sick, and, and, demented. And, and, and also 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 notice also notice right. He's pointing to David. He's pointing to I Isaac. Could be an axe murderer at this time, right? And and, and how would that affect Christian? Isaac is not our guy. Right, I, Isaac is a Isaac is a prophet. We acknowledge that prophets did horrible things. What you're accusing him of is false. I don't know yeah, why Muslims. Do it, yeah. I don't know why Muslims claim to respect the prophets, but they constantly make things up about them like this. Right. Yeah. What I'm saying is, if he had, if he had married, if he had married Rebecca when she was nine or ten or something like that, he's not the pattern of conduct for us. Muhammad is your pattern of conduct. Jesus is the pattern of conduct for us. Amen. Jesus didn't do those kinds of things, right? Yep. So what are you what are you comparing here, right? You say, "Oh, but David, David isn't our pattern of conduct." 
Isaac is in our pattern of conduct. Jesus is our pattern of conduct. Muhammad is your pattern of conduct, according to Surah 33, verse 21 of the Quran. And so that means that your pattern of conduct, according to your God, is a guy who climbed on top of a nine-year-old girl when he was in his 50s and put his penis inside her yeah. over and over and over again, no matter how, no matter how much she's crying. And she then has That's to wonderful. dedicate her life to washing the semen stains off of him because he was so... Yeah. This guy was so weird that his followers would brag about him having sex with between nine and 11 women and girls in one night, not counting his sex slaves, right? He's your pattern of conduct. A guy who took the, 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 the wife of his own adopted son and then abolished adoption to justify it. A guy who got caught in the wife of his bed, Hafsa, having sex with his slave girl and then took an oath. I swear by Allah, I will never do that again. I won't do it again. Please, 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 please forgive me. And then comes back later and says, oh yeah, remember I took that oath? Allah told me I have to break that oath. He says it. it's right here, Surah 66, verses one to two. He tells me I now have to break that oath, right? This is the guy who is your pattern of conduct. If Isaac had done all of those things, we would say, well, Isaac's a, a, a sinner. He shouldn't have done those things. He's a, he's wicked, a bad, he's a, he's a bad moral he's example. Up, yeah. But that's not what your religion does. It says, yes, Muhammad did all of these things. What a great pattern of conduct. You should all be just like him. Yeah. That's what Allah wants from you. Do you really, really not see the difference here? Yeah. And I want to add one thing. Just a side note. It is Muslims like Dale Lee that are dangerous. The fact that they know this filth and want to justify it shows they're very dangerous. These are the people that you, you have to be careful of and watch out for. I have a nine-year-old. If a Muslim like Dale Lee came and asked for my daughter's hand in marriage, I won't be here. I'll be in prison. I have a nine-year-old. When I look at her and how innocent she is, to imagine That's a 54-year-old like. man going to bed with my nine-year-old i'm telling you i would i would lose my testimony and i'd be repenting behind a prison cell asking the lord to have mercy on me but because he's a sick pervert he wants to justify what his prophet did because he's sick and he's a pervert like his prophet but to just to add how immoral and filthy muhammad was and we need to expose him for what he's for, he, for who he truly was folks and i'm gonna ask dale lee let's see if he's man, man enough to answer dale lee what would you say to a man who comes knocking at your door and says, look, I want to marry your sister or I want to marry your daughter for three days. Then I'm going to divorce her. And I'm going to give her money. Do you accept that arrangement? Let me repeat it again. Let's see Dale Lee, if he's really proud of his prophet and he doesn't see his prophet for being the sick pervert that he is. Dale Lee, Abdurrahman, if a man comes knocking at your door and says, hey, Akhi, my brother, I want to marry your sister. Let's say your mother, she's widowed. Your dad is dead. I'm going to marry your mother, now that your dad is dead, or your sister or your daughter for three days. And I'll, I promise I'll give them money and then I'll divorce them. How many of you would say yes to that or you would be upset and probably even get physical and do something to that person? If you get upset and be, ups and, and be disgusted, you just condemn your prophet and you agree he is a pervert because that's what your prophet did according to your sources. It's known as Zawaj al muta pleasure marriage, where people who went out to expeditions, didn't have their wives, couldn't control their hormones. And Muhammad said, it's okay, go to the city or the village, contract marriage with a local there for three days. It doesn't even have to be three days. It has to be less than three days. Pay them and divorce them. We call that prostitution today. And I'm sorry, to be honest, that means your prophet was a pimp. Sorry, I have to call a spade a spade. That means he was a pimp. He degraded and pimped women in the name of Allah. And this is the man you want to... You want to follow and defend and, and present him to us as an example of morality, let alone the fact that he sanctioned that you could rape captive women whose husbands were still alive. Chapter 4, verse 24. Thank Jesus. He's under the feet of Jesus, and he will burn in hell on the day of judgment. And uh, Allah is the ultimate pimp, isn't he? Yeah. And that's what Allah is going to spend eternity doing, right? Yeah, precisely. All right. And, and, uh, there, and, and notice notice the parallel here, right? The, the, the theological parallel, and we'll close out with this. There, there's... There's a parallel here between the theological realm and the moral realm, right? Islam wants to, Islam doesn't actually want to be theologically pure or um, or morally pure. It just wants to say it is, right? So Islam wants to, wants to take all of this pagan nonsense, wrap it up in a ball and say, it's just pure monotheism, right? That's what Islam wants to do. It also wants to say, Hey, hey, you guys want to hire prostitutes and have sex with, 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 with all these different women and so on? No problem. 
We'll call it temporary marriage and it's totally cool. And then, you know, we're not sexually Im immoral like the unbelievers. You're doing the exact same thing. You're just putting some sort of Allah's stamp of approval on the same thing, right? Name me someone who, like your prophet, goes out and has sex with nine to 11 women and girls in a single day. You would, call some, you would call someone like that a sex addict, right? You would say someone, <laughs> someone who's doing like that has, a, has some sort of mental disorder. He's got problems, right? That's your prophet, right? That's your prophet. So notice, what does Islam want to do? It wants to say, we don't want to be, we're not sexually immoral like all of those other guys. No, 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 no. We have a prophet who's having sex with his slave girls and all his wives and a little girl and his adopted son's wife. And he's doing all these things, but it's all good. It's all morally pure. And how dare anyone object to this? It's the same in the theological realm or in the moral realm. Islam wants to do everything that everyone else is doing, right? It wants to, to have all the pagan worship and the bowing down and the kissing the black stone and all that. It wants to have all of that and call it pure monotheism. And they want to do all of this, all of the perverted things with as many women as possible that we find in other realms, but they want to call it pure morality and the, the pattern of conduct for everyone. What is this religion? Is this not, is this not a demonic parody of everything else that exactly. just claims to be from God. Now Come what on, I need you to do, I need you to get up that hadith from Sunan Abu, Abu Dawud about raping captive women. Uh, they were married. You know why? Because you know what Daily just said? What did he just say? He just said, no, no, no. The Quran says married women are forbidden to you. <laughs> you got to marry them with a contract. <laughs> okay. It's Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2150. Okay, guys, you see this why I say this guy is a joke. I pray God will grant him the grace of repentance. This man, Dale Lee, hold him to the fire. He just said, no, no, no. The Quran says married women are forbidden to you. Chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. I guess Dale Lee hasn't read it. I, I got them both. Okay, read. Uh, guys, Dale Lee, listen, because we're going to hold your feet to the fire. You said married women are forbidden. Read 424 and the occasion for it. Chapter 4, verse 24. Man, I'm fast with these sources. So 424, Surah 4, verse 24. Also prohibited are women already married... And that's not the end of the verse, ladies and gentlemen. So married women are forbidden except those whom your right hands possess. Notice, guys, you can't have sex with married women except unless your right hands possess them. You've captured them. Now, let's look at the historical background, right? Because keep in mind, Muslims already knew they were allowed to have sex with their female captives. But typically that would have been after c slaughtering all the men. And now you take the women as your as your war booty. They're not married anymore, right? Their, their husbands are dead on the battlefield, slaughtered by Muhammad's followers, right? So th they already knew. They already knew that they could do that. But now a new situation has arisen. Sunan Abu Dawud, 2150. The apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autas on the occasion of the battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. Notice, this time they caught the men, they captured the men and the women. And so they know that according to the Quran, they're, they're allowed to have sex with their female captives, but they're also not supposed to commit adultery. You're not supposed to commit adultery in Islam, right? You're not supposed to have sex with a married woman. So now we've got a, now we've got a little dilemma here. We want to have sex with these women that we just captured, and Allah says we can do that, but Allah also tells us don't commit adultery, which we'd be doing because their husbands are right there. So let's read that part again, and then we'll see how Allah answers this dilemma. So they defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So Allah, notice, so, so Allah, so the, Allah is responding to this problem. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. So you've got these women, they're there with their husbands. You think, oh, I, I can't, I can't have sex with them. Wrong. Go have sex. Go have all the sex with them that you want. True. Under ordinary circumstances, you're not allowed to have sex with married women. But if you capture them, rape them all you want. Yep. Welcome to Islam, the pure, undefiled religion. But, 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 David. But King David slept with Bathsheba, and Rebecca was and ten that's a response. or a three. And Rebecca, Rebecca was ten or three. Yeah. 
By the way, tomorrow, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, and maybe we should wind it down too, because we're right to over two hours, right? What? But let me, so oh, yeah. two hours. Okay, Lord yeah, Jesus willing, tomorrow, Christian Prince is on, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to go in-depth on muta, Islamic muta. prostitution. We're going to go in-depth on Muhammad having lustful desires for a married woman. His adoptance as wife. We're going to go into raping married captive women and other issues related to Muhammad being a sexual, immoral deviant. Thank the Lord Jesus. He's dead and he's under the feet of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, have mercy on these Muslims. Awaken them by your spirit. Reveal yourself to them. Bring them to your feet. Bless your church, your body. Bless us and seal us by your spirit to never turn away from you, but to be in love with you. And wash us in your blood and bless our loved ones, my daughters. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord Jesus. Christ and, is risen, uh, risen indeed. Isn't it, isn't it an awesome time? Isn't it an awesome time to be a Christian and Hallelujah. to be able to share all of this with Muslims who've been kept in a state of ignorance deliberately by their leaders for 14 centuries? 14 centuries of Muslim scholars have concealed this information from Muslims. They only give them the information they want them to know at that time to keep them confident Muslims. That's what they do. And now, after 14 centuries of Muslim leaders keeping their followers in a state of ignorance, now all of a sudden, through the power of the internet, we have open access Amen. to Muslims around the world, and we have all of their sources to show them that they are being lied to. You Muslims, you have been lied to. That's why you flip out whenever we quote your sources. We tell you exactly what your prophet did, and you're, no, 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 I can't believe that. It's so horrible. We tell you exactly what your prophet said about your God and your theology and your book, and no, 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 we can't, we can't stand that. We hate that. What do you want to hear? Oh, what my mom told me and, you know, the comforting words that my, my imam has told me. I don't want to hear what my actual prophet said or what my God said. Well, too bad. You're going to hear it every time you tune in and you'll hear tomorrow. more tomorrow. Keep praying. July 11th, August 19th, two big dates in my life. Pray for the Lord to show up for the sake of my kids. Christ is risen. He's alive and we love you, Jesus.